Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. Uh, today, awesome guests. Awesome guests. We've got Two Notes Audio Engineering with Guillaume Peel and hey, Mark. B. Justin B. Justin Bryant. Uh, I just realized I should have put my whole name in there. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. How are you guys doing? Good. All right. Thank you for having us, Mark. Oh, thank awesome. you. Awesome for you guys to join. Dave, how are you? I'm just good. Cool. Cool. I'm good. You're good. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Saturday. We're trying these out. Uh, no, oh, awesome. You, be also, you also wanted to uh, allow for Guillaume to be on because what is it? Like <laughs> se seven o'clock your time? It's right a, now? Yeah, it's 7 p.m. Actually, I have to light up some stuff because the, the sun is going down right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool I'm, we're, i appreciate you uh we'll watch the sun set on your face yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's my light <laughs> <laughs> i want to uh, remind everybody that the show is sponsored today from uh sweetwater um and sweetwater uh sells obviously two notes products and sells a, uh, a lot of two notes products i would imagine uh they also opened up a new store in fort wayne i don't know if you guys knew this uh people in the audience i know you you guys probably do but they opened a store in, in fort wayne indiana and um it's a huge store and they've got a section which has thousands of pedals and all the pedals are set up in different stations and each of the stations has a tor uh torpedo two notes torpedo and Audio Technica headphones. So we're also uh, sponsored today by Audio Technica and their headphones, which are the ATH M50X, um, which I've got right here. In fact. Right here. <laughs> they are really, really good, especially when These I, are... plug, I, Go yeah, ahead. I plugged into, um, into the Captor X mm -hmm. late last night. It just sounded great. I was like, the, and they're really comfortable. I like the little coily cord. Um, so, yeah, anyway, it sounded really good. Well, it's really a replacement good. for my trusty uh, ATH M30 or M40, sorry, FX, which I've had for years. Uh, I've actually never had. Like a lot of years, like I like 25 years. <laughs> I never had Audio Technica headphones. Before, so <laughs> yeah, I'm these are better than, than the original ones I had. I'm quite and I like the original ones. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Totally. So, yeah. And so uh, just to share my screen for a second, just to show you guys. Um, here, let me do this real quickly. If, if this works. So you guys can see the uh, Audio Technica headphones at Sweetwater. Yeah. So I, check also out pair, I also have a pair of those. Those are amazing. Yeah, they really are good. So, guys, check out our link uh, that we have below um, for Sweetwater, and you can click on there and find the Audio Technica headphones. Um, so, our yeah. Captor X. Yep, yep. Please do that. Um, and then also, <laughs> well, that was the next. That was the next thing I was going to show, which was um, for here. People can check out all the two notes here at Sweetwater. So, so I'll, I'll stop promoting, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, you can get all this great stuff at Sweetwater. So check it out. And 24 month financing. I just saw the terms on there. Oh yeah. I've never yeah. done the financing, but I know it's, they're, they're quite, quite good. So, yeah. But, uh, so anyway, if, if you, if you want to buy that Bricosti reverb, <laughs> go on, go on there, please, and use our link. Did I say use our link? Yes, use our link. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can use the twenty-four month financing. Yeah, maybe more. Buy yourself a Bricosti <laughs> and uh, SS uh, or API console, maybe. <laughs> twenty-four. Uh, a new desk. A new, yeah. yeah. And then a Captor X. Captor yeah. X. Yeah, Captor X. The whole package going He's on there. Yeah. I actually, I actually have the prototype here. I don't know if you can read, but I forgot oh, wow. I had that here. So this is my home office, and uh, yeah, I ho also have this, which says "Never switch off," which I obviously did. But that's uh, <laughs> that's a, a test unit. 
Oh, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> is never switching off, is that to uh, test it? To yeah. see how long we, it'll live? No, kind of. No, actually, it's, <laughs> it's, it's because when we, when we compile new firmware, they are uh, automatically sent to some test units 24-7 and tested um. in real time all the time. So every time one of the developers pushes a new release, Mm -hmm. it's it's sent to several units tested and if there is an error it comes back and they have to fix it oh. so they, we have like a like imagine a, like a large closet with plenty of units and they run all the time all the time oh i see and yeah. I, I probably stole this one because i needed it and because i'm the boss that let me do it but yeah i shouldn't <laughs> do that <laughs> so i should have said early on that guillaume you're the founder and ceo of two notes Yes, I, I, I started that project in 2005 or six, I think. And I, I started the company in 2008. Uh, and the first product was the VB101 at the Christmas 2008. That was my Christmas gift. It cost me way more money than it brought back, but it was a first step. But yeah, that, that's, that's how I started with, uh, with a few, uh, like we were three people starting it, really. And yeah, it's uh, it's been quite an adventure. And what were you doing before that? Um, actually, uh, so I got uh, I got my PhD in two thousand five, and I was on track to become a researcher. I was working in um, uh, optics for telecommunications, so not really music. And uh, I was just a home uh, like a hobbyist, like many people. So I I got a. Uh, the, one of the first direct-to-disc uh, kind of PC you could have in, in the late 90s. And uh, so I just decided to, to quit the university and try my own, my own thing. Like after I stayed as a, as a professor for, for one, uh, no, no, that's not professor, sorry, it doesn't translate. But for a year, I was just, uh, I didn't have tenure yet. So I was on track for that, but, but I just stopped before. I, I started uh, um, teaching at the university. I still have a uh, once a year. I do a conference uh, at my local university, but that's that's all. <laughs> but yeah, no, I don't come from the music world at all. I was just like a regular guitar player uh, slash home studist. Do you say that? No, you don't say that. Uh, like uh, I have a home recording studio. Mm -hmm. Many people in early two thousand, and I just decided to say, yeah, why not? <laughs> that's awesome that's really well cool. it's, i mean considering it's not really that long of a time between then and now and i mean the company's become quite quite a success yeah it's so, 15 years <laughs> I guess it's the, I, well i guess yeah but that's true 15 years but but you guys have been around i mean even be for between you know like i heard about you guys like several years ago so well, I think, I mean, we started at a similar time. Friedman sort of started around 2009-ish. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's about the, around the same time, exactly. Uh, I, th I think uh, it's probably not just uh, a coincidence. I, th I think we are some of those companies who started really when the internet, especially the internet forums, went like very, very strong. And actually, I used that because I had like no money for advertising or anything. So uh, uh, the, the the first social media actually had many new companies start in two thousand between two thousand two three and two thousand ten, and then Facebook kicked in. But but at the time, I think many many new companies kicked in, and also because you could find so much more resource online for like to help develop the electronics or. The DSP stuff. A lot of people were coming, uh, talking about it online, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think we are. I, I don't know about you, but Dave, you had a ca career before starting this, yeah. really, mm -hmm. but, uh, unlike me. But the, the um, I think that there was a whole movement during those years that allowed for new new companies yeah. to start. Totally, uh, it, it it got so much easier, <laughs> yeah. you know, with 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 uh, you know Facebook in the form at forums really. Then now forums are kind of dead, but yeah. uh, but uh, then for sure, uh, and still to this day, I mean, you know, we we use internet marketing essentially to market all products. I mean, you know, I get magazines still, but 
Mm. You know, I, I like look at the ads in the magazine and I'm like going, I half the times I just throw these out, <laughs> you know, I, or I read them for a, or glance at them and then toss them in the trash. <laughs> I, so I already printed. know about the product that they're advertising in this print for, mm. you know, six to eight thousand dollars an ad. It's crazy expensive. Oh, man, you can do you can do a lot with like eight thousand dollars elsewhere. Yeah, videos yeah. and all sort. You know, that that could be eight YouTube videos. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think I think it happened, uh, and especially in the payroll business but the uh, what happened is that not only you had more resources to understand better how the product works so you could create your own which wasn't really the case for me because it was still kind of new what yeah. i was doing um and uh, uh you had that and you had access to millions of people with just one click mm -hmm. which made a huge difference uh regarding how products are being sold or put on the market so suddenly you could have and i had like they won orders from Japan, from all around the world. And suddenly you have problems because you have to, I mean, I mean, it's a solution, but it's also a lot of problems because you have, oh, okay, so the Japanese, oh, it's, oh, okay, it's not the same voltage. Oh, they have two different voltage because the islands are different. So, and then you have to go into the norms. And no and, ground. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's uh, um, you, you, even if you are just a one guy in a tiny office, you have the entire world in, in front of you and you have big businesses issues right off the bat, which is yeah. quite exciting. It's a challenge. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, that's true. So, Justin, uh, what's your role at Two Notes? Um, I am the director of the North American side, uh, primarily uh, uh, the U.S. We have a uh, distribute, distributor in Canada that handles most of that. So I work with all the retailers, all the logistics, the artists in the U.S. Um, it's about 500 jobs in one job. <laughs> That's good. That's cool. That's it? <laughs> That's it. Well, oh, you do more than that. You and then he yells at me every every couple hours. And it makes me cry. <laughs> oh, okay. no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So yeah. Justin wakes me up in the morning. He's usually the first person. Before I talk to my wife, he's usually the first one hitting me on Facebook while I'm trying to 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 shower. So at 7 a.m., he's still awake for some reason, talking to me about whatever. <laughs> oh, I talked to Dave Friedman earlier today. So I'm like, come on, it's 7 a.m. I don't care. <laughs> I don't <laughs> care. You guys, you work it out. <laughs> I don't want to. I would want to have to think about Dave when I'm showering. Come on. And. Oh, uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so that's what he does. And also some marketing. And of course, you know, Mark, about the new artist series. Uh, uh, Kevin and Justin has been, well, he's, he was the, uh, I mean, he was the alpha and the omega of that operation. So I just said yes and, and, and sent some money to some people and he made it happen. So he's, he's more than just the guy who pushes boxes in the U.S. No, I mean, it's, uh, it's exciting work that you're doing with those well, cabs. We'll talk about the artist series, obviously, in a little while, but just to, to put a, a little bit of a um, addition on the Guillaume, nobody we're working with the art, on the artist series is paid cash up front. So like George Lynch, I just told George what we're doing, and he said, man, it sounds really cool. I'd like to do it. He didn't even ask about money. Phil was the same way. Phil was using the boxes, and he's like, I'm like, hey, let's do your cabinets. He's like, great. So they, they make a percentage of royalties, but it was there was no, I need hundred thousand dollars up front we did it's nothing like that. it was definitely <laughs> he's, like, he's laughing <laughs> so it was very much a these guys were using this stuff so um made it easier but you know let's all kind of share in the in the in the success of it instead of sure. how much do i get up front i'm sure dave you know that world very well yes <laughs> there's no upfront money sorry <laughs> <laughs> signing bonus what's that Mm, mm. Yeah, it, well, it's, it has it's, to be, it, there's there, there's not a powerful uh, there's very 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 few powerful enough artists left to even warrant something like that, and and then it still may be questionable, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah, well, that and and most of our industry is actually very small companies. Yeah. Most businesses are under ten million dollar revenue. It's it's a yeah. You just have the money. Yeah, yeah. it's. I think in the top hundred, when you when you read some uh, uh, 
like markets uh, uh, numbers, the top hundred companies, the smallest one are around a million dollar, which is, which is so small. Yeah. And uh, so nobody has a hundred thousand just to throw at someone. Just to, I mean, nobody's making that kind of money with uh, with that kind of deal. I don't think. I mean, even mm. yeah. It, no. Even the big, biggest guy you can imagine, right. or probably probably Gibson has that kind of pocket money to play with, but that's pretty much it. Or Fender, and that's or Fender, it. and yeah, Fender and Gibson. Yeah. And even then, I get, I guarantee they're not paying that kind of money. Those royalties. Yeah, it's 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 hard to make any money once you spend that much on one. Yeah, one I mean, person. what do you think PRS is paying John Mayer for, like the PRS uh, silver? Yeah. I don't know. I th I think that's only a percentage, to be honest. Which is usually the case, yes, with yeah. signature models. Almost everyone is just a percentage. Right. Maybe he would get some money if he if he makes appearance at a trade show or signings or that kind of stuff. So that's extra, like travel, hotel, and time on the booth or something that I wouldn't understand. I know Slash yeah. works that way but and others, but I, I don't know about that specific deal. But I don't think even PR is at, at that much money to play with, like up front. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. sure John gets a good percentage, though. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> because if you sell, yes, you deserve something. No. No. No problem. Yeah. Yes. And those guitars are selling like hotcakes. I, I worked for PB for for a few years, and and always like to have conversations with Hartley regarding Ed, which was a bittersweet relationship, as a lot of people are aware. But they, you know, that was a different kind of deal at a different kind of time, and you mm -hmm. know, they couldn't have bought that marketing, and they're self admittedly not the best marketing company, but. Hartley even disclosed to me that he goes, I don't know if we ever really made any money on that deal. He goes, Ed did. I don't know that we ever, you know, we ever profited. But again, the marketing that they got out of it's probably very valuable. So, so, so that, that goes back to Dave's thing of extreme cases, right? The rare ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you hey, think Mark, Ed, you know, your Mark, your mic is kind of low. It's low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Compared right. to everyone else. Okay. I will make myself louder. Do you have the compressor on it? Yep. I can bump it up. No problem. I can, I can send you the link to my shitty webcam if you want one. <laughs> <laughs> Is this better? Better? Yeah, it's yeah. louder. Yeah, yeah, it's better. Okay, cool. All right. I bumped it up a few dB. All right. So uh, so what else? Well, we have a super a super chat. Let's get to that. Um, Harlan Jackson, Captor X changing my changing my life. I'm playing my brand new PV Invective MH, which stands for me, by the way. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> How much are you making of that deal? It's your signature deal, right? <laughs> well, they did pay me enough front, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, into my captor while watching this. Awesome work, guys. Yeah, I agree. It is awesome. Thank you, Harlan. I, uh, I'm, I'm newly adopted to it and getting slowly learning my way around it, but, uh, it is very cool. What was fun when I just did the iOS app and it was just like, oh yeah, here we go. Great. My phone's just sitting here and I'm just moving around on it. And it's like, great. And I, I, I must commend you on the plate reverb. Yeah. You like it? Also the plate reverb sounds great. I've, I've spent some time on this one. It's actually a new algorithm. So you have uh, two different algorithms in the unit. So you have the old one, the one we had since day one. And uh, this this new one, which is more like an ambient type of reverb, stereo reverb. Uh, I did the plate with it, the spring, and a few others. I don't quite yeah. remember. But the the I don't even know what I... I don't remember which one I, I, I tried to mimic with it. Well, I usually use several plate that I like. I try to find something in between. Obviously, we didn't have like a real hardware plate, so, right? So we copy the copy, but yeah, yeah. But, okay, you well, know, I, I wanted it to sound good, which is which, which was the target for the spring. I I did have I did have some uh, tube spring reverb, uh, like real ones to 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 play with, uh, because they are way smaller than the uh, the real plate reverb. Yes, <laughs> so <laughs> easier to source, easier to find. Uh, but uh, th thank you for that. Yeah, I spent like quite a few hours. That was the last thing I I set up when. Like, I mean, I, I didn't do any. I just literally just oh, okay. Let's listen. Oh, plate. Yeah, plate. Click. Oh yeah. Okay. Adjust the mix. Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I 
it's it's funny with the reverb because I I never wanted to have like a reverb as an effect. Yeah. Originally, the reverb in the torpedo products were just uh, recreations of rooms, and I found out that guitarists don't really understand that that logic. Yeah. Uh, so finally, I just gave up and <laughs> said, "Okay, let's make some <laughs> here's some effects. reverb, toss it on, great, done." Yeah. And. And, and and actually, you learn from your customers because when they ask you for it, usually there's a reason. And I was like, you have like a zillion reverb in any DAW or pedals or everybody has one. And uh, and but the minute we put it in the unit and we actually designed some presets with it, people loved it. So yeah, but if, if someone's sitting there with a set of headphones and not recording, and they just want to play with on their phone and 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 they're sitting in a hotel room or something, uh, you mm -hmm. know, you can, because it's nice, you know, you got to have a set of headphones on and it's very closed in, you know, and, and very direct. So mm -hmm. like, if you can just add that plate or something to it, even a, a, as someone that's just going to mess with it that way, yeah, it's great because then they're like, Oh yeah, I feel like I'm in the stadium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we just did summer Nam and we have a silent booth which attracts certain people and detracts others, which is both good and bad because at our booths, you can't really show off because nobody can hear you, right? So if you're right. trying to get, <laughs> and get endorsements, we're the wrong booth to do that in. But when people put on the headphones, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when people put on the headphones though, and they start playing, they go, I get it, I get it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the moment we're looking for. But yeah, it's really hard to give endorsements at the NAMM show when you can't, you know, give a concert. <laughs> Any more in this day and age, it's almost like, you know, you get you get people hitting you up for endorsements of things, and they're like, uh, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> what are you doing for us? <laughs> you know, you're not even touring. <laughs> well, I'm about to build yeah. an, an amazing YouTube channel that everybody's going to come to. That's the new. That's the yes, new. I know. I'm about to build it. I have 300 followers right now. <laughs> 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 or yeah, I have 300 okay. followers. Okay, cool. <sighs> come on, you come, you come back. Come back. Come back to me when you have you know at least like 30,000 or something. 30,000. Yeah. Pete Tone started with 300 guys. I mean, of I course mean, he did. Everyone started with something. I'm not saying that they won't get to a point, but. At, at you know, you're you're looking at an endorser as what can you do for me? I can do this for you, but what are you going to do for me? And there's a two way street here. Absolutely. Exactly. So, <laughs> and if I can't do anything for you, why do I even sell you this? You know, and we, I mean, I don't give it to any way anyway. So I sell it at artist cost, but no, and, and I uh, and. I think there is some kind of fatigue because we are so much solicited by so many of these guys trying to make it in a very saturated mm -hmm. market today. And I totally yeah. get what you mean, Dave. I was just playing devil's advocate because every I day I have to say no to one of these guys. And and actually, I'm I'm still trying to find a minute to listen to what they do because because there is the next speed torn in there. Sure, it's there is. Sure. And, and if they, if they, and you know what. And honestly, I mean, we, uh, there was a guy in England, uh, that had a small channel that was building his audience named, uh, Dan Leggett and Dan did great sounds. He was a great player. He did great sounds. And the videos I saw were like, wow, that's, that's great. You know, he was, he was really good. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we started, you know, at first he was like, can I just get a pedal and I'll, I'll do the, you know, the demo and I, all I'm asking for is the pedal. Yeah, sure. No problem. And then we, we start using him and he's really good at it. So that leads to then down the road, getting paid for your video, you know, and, yeah. you know, and becoming, you know, as your channel grows, you can demand more. Exactly. Well, absolutely. And there is, uh, I mean, I think we're a great example of that too. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he's know. he's great. If you don't know who he is, go look him up. Mm -hmm. Uh because he'd be good for you, you guys too. Dan yeah, Leggett. Leggett. I, I would yeah. say that, uh, and uh he, he he does good little videos, a great player and does good explanations and yeah. 
That's cool. It's still growing, but yeah, a good, you know, a great. That's he's in the, he's in the UK, so uh, you have the European audience for it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I saw I saw in the chat earlier. I just want to address something. Someone mm -hmm. was saying that for a French, I had sometimes a very British accent. So so for for the people need to understand. I have two employees in the UK, and I talk to them all day. So, so I tend to mimic what I'm hearing. So when I'm when I spend some time in the US, which sadly didn't happen for more than a year now, I, I tend to to mimic the accent of the people I'm talking to, and then by speaking every day to two very British guys, I, I'm I'm just so yeah. So it's it's not because I had a British teacher. Uh, because you're, you're I, you don't up. learn language at school that doesn't exist. So, <laughs> so you, you learn language when you travel and in the street, and that's all when you work with people. But yeah, yeah it's uh, it <laughs> and I, I love the very posh British accent. I'm not able to mimic that, but when I hear it, it's just like oh, it, it's it's it, it makes other people feel like they are worms. It's awesome. I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> worms. <laughs> but you know what I mean. You know, yes. you know exactly I understand what, what you mean. mean. Yeah. <laughs> Lesser people. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. Um, so, Guillaume, tell us about like some of the, the series of products that you guys have you know, you've worked on and you come out with, um, you know, and Justin that you've worked on as well. I, I'd, I'd like to hear about. You know the torpedo and how that came about, and you know some some of these other products. Yeah, so so we we really have one line of product and another tiny line of product. The big the big one is the torpedo, which uh, concept is to allow people to play uh, uh, their amp in silence or with a control volume. So uh, uh, so we have attenuators, uh, what we call load boxes. A load box is something you plug. In place of a cabinet, so your tube amp doesn't fry. Tube amps need a load to work. Uh, most most of them, some of them have, have are designed to handle that, but most of them need a load. A cabinet is a load, so we try to mimic how a cabinet works or some of how it works. And so that's uh, the torpedo captor X. So that's that's a load box and an attenuator. Uh, we have the captor, which is the black version of that, the the 100% analog product, and we have the pedals. So we have the CabM uh, now CabM Plus. So this is the old one. This Ooh, one is the plus. Speaker sim. Yeah. What's, the, the, what's plus about it? So so what's plus <laughs> about it is uh, dur during the first lockdown. So we pretty much experienced the same one uh, in in March, March, April, May last year. Uh, I was I, I was here at home and I had like an extra hour to spend on stuff because I didn't have to to drive to the office and I was like okay the cabin I want to do some I wanted to do some uh, a new firmware um, because the, the thing with when you do when you do digital is that it's never finished uh, <laughs> not because it's buggy sometimes it's because of that but usually it's because you know you have some extra room to improve this and that is and anything you, ever finished. Not really. Well, I mean, I mean, okay. We also have the the, the two pedals as well. Yeah. I mean, once this one is on the market, it's gone, and usually you don't hear about it, which is awesome. Uh, uh, with the with the <laughs> with the firmware, you always have a tiny something you want to change, or the right. graphics you want to change, or you have a lot of feedback from the customers telling you, okay, I'd like to change this and that. And when you have hardware analog stuff, you will probably make a new version every i don't know 10 years seven years eight years uh depending on your cycle with the, with the digital stuff we try to be on five to seven years or even eight with the with the first torpedoes and uh, uh to achieve that because the market is moving doing firmware update is great that's a good way to to uh, stay away from obsolescence which happens fast with digital um so the, the last year I was like, okay, I want to change this and that and this. And we came up with a, a firmware update that was so big, especially because we added a new preamp, which didn't exist in this. So originally it's a speaker seam that you would plug either between the amp and a cabinet. It's not a load box, so you need a cabinet. Or uh, at the end of your pedal board where you have, for example, Dave's pedals, uh, uh, that could act as a preamp or some other preamp or some of my pedals as a preamp. And then you have that to do the speaker seam and the miking. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so we, we added a preamp. So this is now a standalone unit. You don't need uh, another preamp, but you would need dev spills or other drives or fuzz to, to shed the tone in, in there. So is it like they, a clean, they, uh, like a clean yes. preamp? Yeah, yeah. So, so like I a have fendery, a fendery kind of thing or something? Yeah, I have a 74 basement uh, yeah. at the office that I really, really like. Uh, it's the, I think it's the ultra linear uh, type of stuff. So it's it's hard to 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 make it do any kind of crunch tone, but you can, mm -hmm. but at a volume where no living thing can survive. So yeah. So I, I really love that amp, and I have used it as a as a let's say the the the. the I I never mimic hundred percent. I try. I use that as a foundation, and then I will change a little bit. Just to, I mean, a little bit like, like what you do, David. Like you yeah. start from something, and then there is your touch, and you want to change this and that, or sure. and there is no reason. And I mean, it's just the tone you have here, and you want to make it happen. So yeah. you do the same with algorithm, and uh, and we tune it by year. It's mm -hmm. not that different. Uh, we don't use a solar gun at this point, but but it's very very close the, the way we develop that. And um, so that basement, uh, uh, we we have two modes: one for bass and one for guitar. And the the tone we actually change the tone stack. So we uh, the tone stack is really close to the real thing on the guitar uh, preamp, but on the bass preamp, I had to change the frequencies to make them work a little bit better. Um, well, that makes it that makes it fantastic because then you have you have this viable thing. You have this clean pedal platform direct, and then you can use whatever drive pedals you want into this clean pedal platform. Yes, which is, uh, that makes it super usable. You know, super cool. When you're, when you're talking about firmware updates, um, I know Guillaume had done about it for a while, but the Strymon Iridium was doing really well, and it would kind of came to, can we put a preamp in this? And the answer was yes. And it was just about exactly what we're saying. I'll send, and I'll send a box to you, Dave, but it would be great like for you to run some of the Friedman pedals into this and then check it out and see what kind of response you get. But as far as the EQ thing, it was pretty close to a basement, right, Guillaume? But we did tweak it a little wider so it would fit with all pedals as well yeah. as possible. We just try, you know, we put a mid-range control in there so it would play mm -hmm. nice with everything as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, that- Yeah, that we, made, we, made it, we made it a little bit more effective. Which is easy to do with digital. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Not? Exactly. That, I mean, that that's super cool. It, it serves a great purpose, and and that's great because there's your clean channel, and here's your drive boxes for your dirty. Yes. Um, and, and, yeah. Probably and works like great Mark with the Friedman said, pedals. At the new Sweetwater retail store, they have eight pedal stations, and every pedal station has a cab M attached to it. That's great. No, oh wow. And audio yeah. headphones. And audio <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. The uh, yeah, the uh, AT uh, ATH M fifty X to be specific. It's a long one. How much are you making every time you say the the name? Because I'm I'm not in. I can say it too. I have to have a few. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut you in. We'll cut you in. <laughs> no, they're they're cool headphones. Um, they are. We well, have they a, really are actually. I, we don't. You know, that's another thing. You know, like if if. If we say something about a product, it's not just bullshit. I mean, like I can't, I can't honestly come on and say this is great, right? When it's not, no, it's got, it's got to be good, or, or it's just not going to happen. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Oh yeah, exactly. That's I agree. I'm a the straight shooter when when it comes to that. <laughs> we'll have to. Yeah. I remember years ago, uh, a million years ago. Uh, uh, back, back, oh God, this must have been very early '90s when Mesa Boogie brought in. I was working at making music at the time in uh, uh, in Los Angeles here, and they brought in the the new Mark IV. Mm -hmm. I was never a huge Boogie fan. They brought in the new Mark IV, and 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 I'm like. Well, can you kind of dial it in more like kind of a Marshall -y tone, you know, because I was more into that kind of thing. And, you know, I think it was Doug West. He was dialing it in, trying to dial it in. And I played it and I'm like, yeah, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked out. <laughs> hey, you don't like it. You don't like it. By the way, we got I mean, I think that was the worst of the Mark series, personally. <laughs> well, have, they, they uh, kept as the series went on. Mark II uh, C plus was the best. Mm. 
And as the series went on, it got progressively worse. <laughs> the Mach 5 is pretty good. I, I actually like it. I haven't heard it. Look who we have. Michael Nielsen. Hey, gang. Hello. What's going on, Michael? I just hang out in the back of Dave's shop, and I just drop in whenever. I'm always watching. Yeah, he moved the studio back next to Pete's. No. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many more guitar guy studios can you fit in there, Dave? <laughs> None, actually. None. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I keep condensing my space smaller, so as we... Uh, well, I was just there. I don't think you can. You know, r- you know, rent in Los Angeles is huge. So, <laughs> a, a, a nice space here costs a fortune. So you got to try to maximize. The, yeah, exactly. The, uh, the the people here, you know, maximize the space. Totally. So we've got Michael on because Michael worked with Justin on the uh, recent Captor X artist series cabs, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I've been kind of online friends with Justin for a little while and, um, I got to do a big hairy guitars cab pack, uh, which was super exciting to me because, um, I loved the two notes platform and I was using it for all of my IRs. It just like whether it was a third party, a static IR or whatever you could, you could still use the software because it's really, um, it's low latency and it has so much functionality. Um, rather than just, you could also drop an IR into like space designers, like a very simple, just playback thing, but theirs has the EQs, compression, play reverb, all all this stuff that you can kind of tailor. Um, and then you, you know, save the whole setup. Uh, and then for me, because I have a pretty nice, uh, live cab setup here, whenever I would use other people's IRs, I'd always be a little bit frustrated because that's not the sound I was used to. And there was always something I was trying to dial in that I got perfectly fine with my cab. So being able to create the the, uh, dynamic IRs of my cab was just like, oh, this is the best, because now I I open it up and like that's the sound I'm used to hearing. And it it translates really closely. And I don't have to change settings on my amps to something extremely different that's foreign to me. so that's super great. And then when it came time to do um, the Lynch pack, uh, Justin asked and was like, Lynch, just w- when and where? Like, sh- sure, man. <laughs> okay, uh, we have 24 hours to put everybody together. Can you be here in 24 hours? <laughs> yes, how many pa- How many cabs are we doing? <laughs> Painful. So my, well, I'll go back for, for Michael. Michael, as he said, was, was using the products and he, did some really cool stuff with the cab M. He would like AB the cab M against his VHT power amp and got some amazing results. But Michael also did some other third party capture work. And I was super impressed. I was, I was a customer and I was like, man. And then I approached Michael about doing a, a BHD or big hairy guitar pack because I was a fan of his stuff and they came out, his pack came out. Excellent. It's one of our biggest sellers too. So um, when I called him and found out he was close to the studio, I was like, man, I'd love to have your help on this. So, Thank you again. What what cabs did you do, Mike? Uh, I, well, there's this guy yeah. I know. <laughs> this guy you know that that had this cab that he yes. kind okay, of well, let me gave you. Great story. Right? <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I had used because you know the, uh, I'm a big fan of Bogner from way back, and Bogner was one of the like original like sort of like rock star boutique uh, high gain amp guys, and so that that logo was always like oh my gosh that's so cool so a long time ago i uh was trying to figure out how to get a 412 sound uh this was before irs really took hold um i tried everything i tried all of the iso cabs i built a like a 12 by 12 giant road case that was in my garage that i went up through the wall to my second story and i had that down there that sound all of them sounded like garbage they were so terrible Mm -hmm. so finally i ended up uh, i got this bogner 412 and i just put it in the back of the room behind me deactivated all the speakers except for one um which actually doesn't sound too bad if you're going for a lower volume you could kind of get away with it uh so i've had this bogner 412 for ages and in the literature or back in the day it was like yeah this is like this is the quintessential marshall cab um, 
which was okay. What, I, what did I know? That's the only cab I uh, 412 I really uh, ever owned um, at the time. So uh, jump forward many years, there was a sound I was trying to get. Like I'm demoing Dave's amps and stuff. And it's like, it's always like there's something I'm trying to squeeze out and it's not the amp. And then Dave was like, hey, why don't you, I have this cab. I've, you know, cabs are big. Who needs a hundred cabs laying around the house, I guess. He was like, try this out. Put one mic up on, on this cab Dave uh, sent over. And is like, oh, that's the, the it's the, Mar the Marshall sound that I've been really looking for. It just breathed more. It had more of that Angus Young sort of mid-range crack. It's felt like it sustained more. Mm -hmm. So my Bogner cab, uh, which I had gotten great results from, it's now on a shelf kind of in my live room. And I've just like <laughs> fell in love with this, this uh, beat up Marsh Marshall that that dave gave me that yeah it was a it was a jc uh 800 cab that had old i'm pretty sure uk uh yes green uh, uh vintage 30s in and two uh heritage greenbacks yes i i opened it up the other day actually yeah. and i was like oh that's what's in there yeah and huh. and because i was like he was doing videos for us and there was always something so dry or something not quite lively enough about the tone and i'm like Heck, here take this cabinet just like he said you know take this cabinet i'm not using it at all hmm. uh right currently and uh just take it <laughs> we'll talk about it later take it <laughs> so that's and, one of the uh, cabs on there yes and, and, uh, and, the other and, is, is the bogner cab that I've I've probably miswired four speakers into, so it has its own sort of sound as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the the thing is, here's the here's the difference essentially. So in a Bogner cabinet, they 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 do um, batting on the back panel, like uh, uh, uh you know the acoustic batting. Like um, older cabinets actually had like an insulation. I think newer cabs had like a kind of a cotton, some sort of white batting. To me, what that does, uh, if you know what a dead room sounds like for a guitar, like a really dead room, like an overly dead room, stuff sounds awful in it. Yeah, there's no reflection, but there's no nothing. It's, it's just, like an it, ice cab. It, it just sounds like I can't dry furry awfulness hmm. and um and so uh you know you there, there's a there's a fine line between too live and then too dark and, and too too dead and you have to find that line a little bit uh but you want a little ambient in the cabinet that batting kills all to me all the liveliness of the cabinet so are bogner heads voiced for those cabs no, not necessarily, but uh, this is what they've always done, mm -hmm. and and I I just don't think it sounds like the the sounds that you're trying to mimic. I don't think it sounds like those sounds. You know, it doesn't yeah, sound like that Angus so Young thing, or it doesn't sound like that those classic records because they were all done with Marshall cabs. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in a Marshall cab. You know, it's just. The, the best example I've heard of it is, uh, you know, Johan uh, Sedgborn, the he has a Sedgborn, yeah. I'm not sure if I pronounce it. He did a, took a 412 and he stuffed the crap out of it with pillows and isolation and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you can hear for a really extreme example of what that sounds like versus like that, that Marshall cab barely has anything in it. It's just, it has a, nothing in it. It's just wood and the speakers. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I mean the Friedman caps are made too. I mean, it, I just there's there's a certain liveliness that happens with just the wood. Um, so I'm a firm believer in not doing that in a guitar cabinet. Interesting. Hey, in the minute Michael sent me clips, he sent me clips the minute he got the cabinet. He sent me some really just really quick little clips, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> and he did a comparison to the other cabinet with the same speaker in it, you know, and it was like, holy crap, that's way like it, it, it sounds tighter, actually. Yeah, the, the bogger sounded looser, like in the low end. It was interesting. It felt like it had it, it really it sustained it like more, sustained more, like yeah. notes would just sustain, which was super. <clears throat> 
so let me ask you this did it come through in the uh in the the cab capture that can you tell that in the bogner oh, cab totally. Or, yeah totally yeah yeah they have a totally different sound i was gonna so, hear I those I think the Jake video for the the Jakey Lee head is the first one where I started using that. Yeah, and it, that that tone was just like, well, that's so. yeah, match made in heaven. Yeah. Right. yeah, the minute you started using that, all the videos all of a sudden were just like epic. Ciao. <laughs> yeah, you know, like you did with your Marshall that I have right now. You know, comparison to the B one hundred Deluxe or or the B B one hundred you have. I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the, uh the mini be head uh I that used, sound great too yes but that that uh was the because i was using direct out of the mini be head yeah uh, and which you could just go straight out of the the effects send mm -hmm. go straight in and then i was using the two notes um the cabs for that mm -hmm. and that sounded awesome and but then, then for, later, later in the video you had it into a cab though right yes which also yeah. sounded awesome it they sounded really sounded good awesome, yeah you know it's kind right. of like what whatever works. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I, both. I played with the 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 this Captor X over here is loaded with um the the Lynch and the the Phil cabs, <clears throat> and I played with those. I like the Lynch. The Lynch cabs are cool. I like Phil's cabs too. They're pretty different, aren't they? Amazing that they're, you they're can very have different. A yeah, I mean, I like <laughs> the old Lynch Marshall cab uh or mar cab or whatever you call it and then the the vh1 both speakers are cool you know so so michael can tell you this as well the mars cab is the cabinet that george used all through dink dawkin dinkin dawkin and lynch mob it had 20 watt heritage in the top and 25 watt uh uk yeah, i think i worked on that one <laughs> yeah i think you did and uh and then the vh cabinet had green worked on that one too bottom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know about it, yes. And uh, and then it had the JBLs in the top. So we, what yeah. Michael and I were very careful of doing is pulling the backs off everything and then making sure we weren't miking redundant speakers because those cabinets are about the same exact age. And yeah. it probably would have been so close, nobody could have told the difference. So we wanted to make sure that we had variants in the speakers too. Yeah, it was cool. I, I, found, I found on the VH1 cab, like the stock preset that comes up, I, I, I ducked the... the um, because there was two different, uh, you used 121 sometimes, but then you used the BK something, ribbon or something. BK 5A, right? that was George's yeah. mic, yeah, from the 50s. And I that one, I, the, on one of the cabs, maybe it was the old, the not the VH1 cab, the other cab. That was on, and I found I had to duck that a little bit. Because when it comes up in the preset, it sounds... Not out of phase, but slightly has that slight phase thing, and you you duck the ribbon just a little bit from it, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, there we go. Hmm. It's just a matter of preference. I think George had mentioned that the engineer that taught him about that mic had mentioned he doesn't use it in conjunction with stuff, which he, he I don't know if, Justin, if you remember that. I thought he said yeah, that he liked to use that one on its own for whatever it's worth. That's cool. Hey, I just want to get to the super chat real quick. Andrew Paul, thank you. Uh, hey, Dave, wanting to do some DIY pedal work. What do you recommend for top-notch soldering iron? Any good resources to watch? Um, uh, Heiko. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> it's right here. Oh, God. Which model is it? Uh, it's a Heiko solder station. It's the two. Oh, God. Hang on. <laughs> I have to look. Uh, 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 200 something. I know. Um, Echo Soldering Station. It's the oh, sorry, FX88D. Uh, that's what we use in production. That's what we use here at the shop. Uh, it's a great solder station. It's like a hundred dollars, roughly. What's the wattage? Um, Variable, it, goes like up, it, go, it goes up to past 800 uh, degrees. That's like the so. lightsaber mode where you just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in this day and age, we use it at 750 or 800 all the time, oh. pretty much for everything. <laughs> just because wow. uh, uh, solder and we use uh, lead free solder most of the time. So, 
I miss requires, the uh, requires a higher the, heat. The, the non have, here the here at my custom shop, we have leaded solder also because we work on little amps and we use it for that. Because uh, we can get away with using whatever. I, I like both actually. The the solder we use is an aim, an aim solder, a lead free solder that actually pretty flows relatively like the old stuff. <clears throat> Interesting. Interesting. So tell us more, Michael, about and Justin about the day with Lynch uh, going through the cabs. I'm sure it was yeah. funny. Yeah, I want to hear more. <laughs> so what studio <laughs> were you at? And, you know, so George and I uh, talked about what studios and, and he, he George has a nice studio, home studio, very nice home studio. It wasn't going to be large enough uh, for what we were trying to do because we mic the front and backs of all the cabinets. Um, so George and I talked about every studio you could think of in LA and he unequivocally said Henson, which was A&M studio D no question. I said, what about a or B? And he goes, no room D is the room. Yeah. And that was also known as John Shanks's room for a long time. And there's been so many classic guitar records done in that room. Uh, so the, the funny part was he's worked, George has worked in there a lot. So he was able to, to hook me up with the studio manager with the caveat being we had one day, because that it was locked out for another four or five weeks after. So imagine getting George, Michael, a guy to shoot some video, an assistant engineer in there, myself, mm. with one day to do it. A lot and to do it. A lot to do. We it. had no room for error at all. Well, you nailed it. And then Michael had to take a nap for three days after. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, my back was set. the doors at Henson are really heavy. So, like, <laughs> yeah. you have to go back and forth without giving away the process. It's a complicated process, and uh, it, it takes a lot of moving parts and a lot of size and stuff to really capture the, the full oh, breadth yeah. of the sound. But you have to go from the control room to the live room, and you also want to make sure things are right. So it's like doing bench presses every time you're going through this door. Like, Ugh. yeah. Ugh. yeah. <laughs> back in. Ugh. So I was exhausted by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. Um, there's something I think that's important to add in there uh, that Michael was saying is working with the artist, when we work in these nice studios, you get complete isolation from the live room to the control room. And I keep the artist in the control room for one very specific reason is to remove confirmation bias. And there's some B footage of George, for example, where we would we would have one channel that would have the capture X feed. We'd have another channel that would have the mic, mic, you know, mic sum together. And I like to do things with guys, and I did it with Phil X the same, where we start A-Bing back and forth, and then they don't know what's what. And you know when you're there, when they can't tell a difference from the A from the B, when they're like, it all sounds good. When they lose that ability to see what's going on, mm -hmm. and then they don't know exactly which one they're doing. Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. Blind test. Yeah, I mean, I, I always say the same thing. Uh, whenever I uh, am doing anything with an artist or anything, we have to do an a b test with an amp like if it's two amps we have to do an a b test with an amp switcher in real time without you knowing which is what and if you guess wrong five different times it's just like sorry yeah it's fine right <laughs> because yeah. because i guarantee they look at it and they go, that, that's the Marshall and that's the whatever, the Friedman or whatever we're doing, whatever we're being. And they're like, well, yeah, I like the Marshall better. Yeah, that, that's better. And they, if you blindfold them and they don't know, I guarantee the results are different. Right. I'll give a plug to Peter Aarons and Amp Pete. Um, it's changed my workflow at my house. I know that you guys use them as well. Yep. Those are amazing switchers because you can just push the button mm -hmm. and it's instantaneous and that's the that's how you remove that confirmation bias because as soon as you unplug the amp and plug oh, it to another done. amp yeah. it's done it's done yeah yeah and and it's happened so many times and i prove people wrong all the time yeah. like it's like no <laughs> yeah there there is something funny i like to do with uh we have two racks at the office so we can switch between 16 amps and uh, uh i i find it fun to to help people realize that actually some amps which supposedly sound very different can actually be tweaked to sound quite uh, oh, yeah. similar. Mm. And um, uh, the latest one that I think is funny is trying to tweak a very 
good clean tone with uh, with an EVH, uh, like the latest one, EVH3, I don't remember the name, but you have like a three degrees on the gain on the clean channel, I mean, clean channel before it starts distorting. So yeah. if you if you put that at the right place with the right volume, it's actually pretty decent. It's unusable in real life, but, but with a switching system and in a studio environment, the clean tone is actually decent. It's not amazing, but, but you can use it unless you're on stage or unless you want to switch channel and it's just impossible. But the, the, it's funny because as soon as you separate the people from actually plugging into it and have that, that, that process that actually conditions the way you will hear it later, if you remove that from the, from, <clears throat> from the session, suddenly you can actually hear what's happening. And I think in, in our jobs, you need to, you absolutely need to do that. Otherwise, you get tricked yourself. You know the, the, the story of the, of the sound engineer who's tweaking an EQ forever and suddenly realize it's off. I mean, it, it happens. <laughs> it actually happens. Yeah, that's funny. So yeah, I won't fall down this rabbit hole, but high gain amps of a certain uh, type of tone stack, I, you'll see like metal guys with like 24 amp heads. And it'll all be slight variations of the same exact amp. I'm going, how much different are all those amps going to sound when you record them? Yeah, you know? no, no. I mean, like you can, yeah. You just turn the knobs and you can probably mimic. Hmm. Each amp can come pro probably mimic. <clears throat> Michael, Michael and I have talked about doing this video where we would take a Friedman B Deluxe and like A, B it to several uh, other amps like a vintage plexi an 800 and all this stuff and see exactly how close you could dial in the amp to Several one of these days we're going to do that you yeah. should do well, that that's I actually mean, a really good idea but my my uh super lead and the the be 100 i have which is yeah you did it. I, ha I have less yeah, control it was so close it was really shocking really shocking how cool. the only the only thing you get from a non-master amp that you're cranking is you get a certain amount of dynamics with it that's a little more intense so like you roll off it gets much cleaner mm. you pull it up it gets you know raging and there's a certain uh when when you smack a chord there's the, there's this uh compression and sag that happens with the amp you feel it kind of like dip and come back and and it just has this cool feel to it yeah well you I, really you really can't entirely simulate that with a kind of all inclusive preamp gain sort of amp mm -hmm. you can get it sounding really close but there there is a slight Slight feel difference. It's not far off, in, in my opinion, that then like the speaker and cab simulations yeah. where like it, you could blind test and you could get 50 50 easy. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is like this like 0.1% that like sometimes it speaks out and you go like, oh, okay. Well, in this scenario, that spoke out a little more. You know, if you're layering four tracks of guitars mm -hmm. and you're in a mix. Maybe you can't hear it at all. Yeah. No. Probably not. Eric Johnson <clears throat> will, will, might notice, you know, right away. <laughs> or, or, or Phil X might notice. Um, by the way, something that I think is important to bring up is speaker cabs and speakers have a tremendous uh, effect on how an amplifier is going to sound. Uh, for instance, yeah, you can take a filter. You know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> well, when you start you take around. A, you take a basement through an old Marshall cabinet, crank it up, starts to sound an awful lot like a Marshall. Crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Telly Cathster, what's up? Thanks for the super chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you consider doing a Vox style lunchbox head with two notes IRs similar to the Rev D20 around similar price? Vox tone is integral to my style. I think he's asking you, Dave. Well, um there will be a vox style amp that will come eventually that uh because there's going to be a vintage line eventually uh that is kind of recreations of my vintage vox ac30 i own and uh, my plexi 50 that i own and and recreations of those amps 
I highly doubt that they will have any IRs built in, but I would suggest just buy the Captor X with it, and there you go. You you can even do a silent stage with it, and you know get the whole the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not the vintage line. Will, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'd incorporate the two. It's just like that. Not it's, in the vintage line. It's too it's 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 too modern for the vintage line. Yeah, yeah. you know, but buy the Captor X. <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I could also answer that question <clears throat> because we we work with uh, several M brands. Uh, I can't tell too much about what will happen, but I do think a voice a Vox kind of thing could happen probably next year. Uh, I can't say who would release that, but mm-hmm. I think it's possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not a secret that we work with Victory, and we just released an M with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Victory could may want to do something like that. It's yeah. a different approach than they. They are they they. It, it would never be some kind of vintage kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. uh, and I, I agree with Dave that if you market something to be uh, uh, this in the same spirit of all the amps we used to love, uh, uh, you should shouldn't probably try to modernize it too much. Yeah, but and other manufacturer they have a different. Uh, they address a different segment. Well, here's an, I don't know, you know, like, um, here's another thing. I mean, like, if you buy one of these, you can use it on any amp you own. And chances are you're going to sell, buy and sell a million amps. Right. And uh, as people do. Mm-hmm. And this box you just keep. And then, you know, it's small, it's easy, it's small, it has great features, it has a Bluetooth capability, the whole nine yards with your phone, and you can load all these great things into it. It does a lot. You can have a silent stage if you want or not. Mm -hmm. does a lot. So why? Record record right into your computer directly that way too. Yeah. I agree. Um, James Maxwell, thanks for the super chat. Does the weight of a guitar affect its tone in any consistent way? Also, I now have two no hose, a specialty, and a JJ Jr. All nice. amazing. Nice. He's a he's a customer. The weight of your guitar. Well, sure. Um, that's sort of the density of the wood. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, will you like one over the other? Yeah, they'll be different. Sure. I mean, even if you take the same piece of like, uh, let's say you have alder and you have a really light alder piece and a heavy alder piece, it's going to affect the tone. Um, how much? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I have an overwhelming preference if it's heavy or light. I, I kind of go in, right in the middle. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, yeah, but I mean, like if you change woods, it'll drastically affect things. Like if you go with a hard ash or a maple or, or basswood or, you know, different things that drastically change the, the body, you know, drastically. What do you got there? I don't think yeah. what do you people got realize you have two here? Here. Yeah. What is that plastic? Aluminum. Oh, oh, is that one of those? Uh, which one is, is that? Oh, wow. Who made that one? It's a, it's a tiny French builder uh, oh. uh, called uh, GL. Mm-hmm. And they they replicate a little bit what you can have on a kind of a flame maple, but it's yeah. still aluminum. But it's a, it's a, the, the neck is wood. But this yeah. is it sounds like, cool. a bit like a banjo. So it's weird. It sounds like a banjo. <laughs> there, there, there was a when I was in Spain. There was a there was a guitar builder out of Spain doing these all. Um, literally cnc'd out of uh, aluminum i think aluminum or, or pretty sure it was aluminum completely cnc'd guitar everything fretboard frets everything you can replace the whole fretboard if you needed to replace the frets but the whole wow. thing was metal and it was quite good actually it was really really good and it actually sounded really good um mm-hmm. it was really well done i don't unfortunately don't have the name of the the company was it, handy was it super expensive dave question yeah, for you i don't think it was that expensive um yeah. 
for one, you, you, you obviously have your own line of guitars. You could take two identical Friedman's and they could have the same wood weigh, they could weigh almost identical, same pickups. They're going to sound a little different, but people don't realize that till you play them side by side, but they'll be close. Slightly but, different. I mean, they'll be relatively close. But my, my thing was um, like people, George Lynch built his uh, ESP series with maple and they're very, very, very heavy. The, yeah, the old ones heavy. from the 80s. Oh, yeah. George's logic was that those guitars had a certain mid range that could cut a little more. I mean, oh, they cut. Back, crazy. They cut for sure. They, uh, I remember George's original Tiger that came through. Um, that he he had it here one day, and I remember hearing it, and it was a very cutting tone, uh, almost to an extreme. Like it, it, it didn't fare very well with like the amps at the time that he was trying to use, which were more plexi based amps. It fared better with a higher gain thing. Um, but yeah, that it's almost like a brick. Imagine a brick with a pickup in it. <laughs> I mean, the, it's, it's got, it's, it's, it's very percussive and very hard sounding. Right. So you, it's depending on what your amp is and what your pickup is and everything, it's going to really play, you know, come into play with how that guitar will sound. Did you ever uh, get to check out Ed's uh, Frankenstein Strat? I, I'd heard some conflicting stories about the weight of that, that the body was very heavy. Some of, a few people said it, it was lighter. It wasn't extremely but... heavy. It was, it was on the heavier side. Uh, I wouldn't call it like pick it up and go, oh, my God, it's like a, you know, what were those late 70s ash, hard ash strats that you pick up and they're, you're, it's like a rock. Right. You know, like a boulder you're picking up. Um, it wasn't that heavy. Yeah, I played it. Sure. Of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. Well, the reason I was asking is like the late 70s uh, thing, early 80s was heavier was better, right? That was kind of um, the, the story. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess that's what they were going for at the time. I mean, it's not that those can't be great guitars, you know, from what I've heard is, uh, um, from what I heard, John Sykes, Les Paul his famous. Les Paul is really heavy. Mm -hmm. I haven't felt it personally. You might have Michael. Yeah. It's heavy. It's like really heavy, like mm -hmm. a brick. Yeah. But like, what would a, a seventies Les Paul custom that was light, I would totally be very like, that's bullshit. That's fake. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I yeah, I don't I don't even think of it that way. I just like if you plug it in and it's great, it's great. But you know, but then again, I'm not standing on stage with it. So, you know. Right. Uh we got a super chat from Fed Freddie Forbes. Uh say that ten times fast. Freddie Forbes, Freddie Forbes. Um Dave opinions on preamp versus power amp gain in your own amps. I own a BE50 and twin sister, and both seem to come alive around six alive to life around six or seven on the master. Yeah, most amps do. Well, six or seven on the master on both those amps would be slightly starting to distort the power section. Uh probably. Up until five, though, they're not really distorting the power section yet. Um yeah, I mean they sound good low also, but uh yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I love, you know, don't get me wrong, like everything I was based my amps on was a non-master volume products, you know, old amps like vintage plexis and different things. I love that, but it was it, you know, at the time, it's like how do you make an amp that you can use at any volume that kind of simulates that tone? That was the whole basis of it all. So, um you know, you had to come up with ways and you had to just simulate and, you know, like, okay, here's what that sounds like. And let's listen to this until you get it just perfect. I've done it with a B100 Deluxe and my 50 watt Plexi where you can amp switch it between them. And, and people are like, I don't hear the difference. Hmm. You know, they're, they're just lost at which one's which. Hmm. Um, 
but the, you know, this is why I still want to do the vintage line because then I get my, my thing, you know, there's, there's, there's something to be said about power to distortion. It's cool. And these and days also- it makes it easier. It seems like there's a, a push. I'm finding a push from players and people that want that vintage part because now they have like the Captor X or, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, Fry at Power Station and different things that they can use their non master volume amps, crank on 10, and get that tone and any volume, you know? Right. You know, personally, I don't, this is just me personally, don't love what happens to the speakers when you're at like volume eight on a 100 watt head. And that yeah. could just be an experience thing of like Eddie knows how to control that because that's what he grew up on. But it's it's a whole nother thing you have to worry about in the sound contours and low end changes. And mm-hmm. I, I much prefer a, a sound coming out of the speakers at a more reasonable volume. Hmm. Yeah, because then the speakers they- start distorting and, and they start getting tired. And as you're pushing more volume through them, they get they they literally change the tone over a certain period of time, you know, as they get war- hot, so to speak, the voice oh. coils get hot. And the amp yeah, EQ becomes less effective. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why Phil X likes 75 watt and 65 watt speakers. Uh, he likes higher wattage normally because he can push them harder. He thinks they're a little more dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't tend to cone cry like a greenback would or maybe a vintage 30 a little differently. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least that's his logic anyway. I mean, Dave, you've got a lot of experience with him on that. Yeah, no, he likes that. And you know what? Frankly, I mean, his his old beat up 75 watt cabinet sounds fucking fantastic, you know? It, it does. Great. Pete's yeah, here. Man, we, Look who's with us. Hey. Pete Thorn. Hey, Pete. Howdy. How are you doing, <laughs> How man? You doing? We got some folks in France. We got some folks in Los Angeles. Florida. 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 Justin, what, where are you in Texas? I'm uh I'm in Denver right now. Oh, Denver. So this is perfect timing for Pete to join because uh, this question from John DeShane, any chance of a Dave approved BE cab SIM for the Captor X? Hey, look at that. <laughs> 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 what do you know? So well, seems, seems like that will be happening. So, and Pete Thorne. Possibly. And why not? What? Get out of here. The more the merrier. <laughs> I think this yeah, is world exclusive. There's some new cab packs that are probably going to be coming down the pipe. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we've talked about it and the idea of um, some unique cabinets that aren't the things you could probably already find, you know, and both Dave and I have some of those. So some some interesting stuff that folks might want to try and use for their luscious guitar tones. That's awesome. I think I think we just leaked leaked the future, but yeah, going back to what you just said, Pete, I think people are gonna I think people are gonna be excited. Yeah, Michael, I'm what excited. are you doing next week? Now, now that now they're gonna be oh. bugging you and bugging you and bugging. You. <laughs> that's good. When that's they good. coming out? It's quality problems. It's good. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So, what what kind of special cabs do you have, Pete? Uh well, we, we're still talking about that, but um, like for instance. I've got a couple of uh, 1960 cabs, an A and a B cab that are both loaded with blackbacks, like late 70s blackbacks. Uh, well, one of them's actually sitting right behind me. So that cab right there mm-hmm. is this cab was actually it's a repro B cab made by the folks at Blockhead or whoever did their cabinets. Um, so it's a really really accurate like 68 cab that Gene from Ultrasound in New York actually had made for me years ago. And he got really into talking about how, oh, you know, the birch and how it's braced, but not too tight, like just kind of like they used to make them uh, and, and that kind of stuff, you know, because a lot of modern cabs will have like the batting inside them and stuff like that, which is the sound. But it, that's not the way they did it back in like mm-hmm. the late 60s. So this cab accurately reflects what an old, you know, B cab was like. So right now it's loaded with four G12M 75 hertz blackbacks from the late 70s that I found from a guy here. In Southern California, but this speaker right here is actually a 1973 G12M 55 hertz. It's kind of a rare speaker, bass cone, greenback, mm-hmm. hmm. 25 watt bass cone, and it's got a unique sound where it just sort of shifts the low end in a really cool way. And I think it's a really cool speaker. So, 
So that so that's a unique cab with some really cool Primo vintage old speakers. And besides that, I've got a 410 also that Gene from Ultrasound in New York got to me years ago. That it's it's kind of a small, looks like a three quarter size 412, but it's a 412 and it's an open back, and was made by a boutique cab builder somewhere on the east coast. <clears throat> he said, "You got to try this cabinet. It's awesome." And and because Gene was just really cool, he used to do these things for me. Sometimes he sent me out this cabinet, and here's this 410, and it's got blues in it, uh, Alico blues slash in. So really cool for your, to a completely different thing for you know, Vox or Matchless or Bruno or Top Hat or stuff like that. Um, for tones along those lines, totally. I've never seen anything like it. An open back 410. Um, and then besides that, we've got my. You know, signature PT two twelve that goes with the PT fifteen. That's a really cool, great sounding, compact but yet really big sounding little two twelve. That's got a green back and a V thirty. Uh, you know, modern green back, modern V thirty, but in a two twelve, nice and tight. So those are some of the things that we've talked about so far that are some unique cabs that would be things that maybe you don't have yet. You know, that's killer. There, yeah. there is a question that pops very often, and and uh, I'd like to address that. I mean, it's not in the chat, but it could be, which is uh, how many four by twelve with with vintage thirties do you need in the library? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think pe most people ignore that even when you do a close micing recording of your cabinet, you still get some of the room, you still get some of the floor, you still yeah. get. Uh, uh, a different microphone, a different mic preamp, uh, and, and all those parameters are like spices in your food. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, you, you, can, you can take chicken, but you have a, a, a zillion ways to, to cook chicken. Yeah. And it, it's really the same with speakers. So some people get attached to the speaker model for some reason, and some others will look at the box itself. Some other people will say, yeah, but what kind of room? Earlier, we were talking about those uh, very uh, insulated room. And when I started uh, my project, like in 2005 or something, I was rehearsing in a, in a studio that was really dead. Like everything was padded. It was totally dead. And when we did the first recording for the original torpedo the first uh, uh capture we did were like awful i was like there is no there is no high end there is what, what's wrong and i thought the algorithm was was fucked mm -hmm. <laughs> so we worked on that and then we did other recordings in a proper studio room live room and uh that's that's actually even to me it was a surprise because i didn't have that experience to to record in a very dead room to rehearse it was fine because you have the drummer, you have the other, all, all that noise around you. So a dead room makes sense. But to record, it was awful, even with closed mic. So mm -hmm. when you put all those parameters in, you realize pretty soon that uh, a Pete's 4x12 with V30 will not sound like mine. Even if you take the same cabinet and put them in different room with different mics, it's it's a, you will still have some of it. So it's still chicken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But yeah. everything you put around it, yeah. it's so much different that it's just a different taste. Of course. And of course. so the the, the, the the answer is there is no limit. Yeah. yeah. Some, something you address with, with uh, misconception is we don't use simulated microphones from a, a software library. So it isn't a 57 that we've modeled or convoluted somewhere that's plugged into all these different things. Part of the artist series is, is definitely the artist, like someone like Pete, who's known for tone and, and, and recording great, great guitar sounds and working with great artists. But the studio definitely matters because some of the comb filtering, the reflections, all that stuff comes through. But the microphones that we use are a little different for every cab pack. Uh, you know, working with Pete or working with Dave, even Michael, it's like we pick a combination of dynamic condenser ribbon microphones that the artist uses. Uh, the preamplifiers matter. The power amp that we use to to capture things it, it's all part of this. Guillaume said that that soup. So yeah, a, a V30 and a 412 and a 57. It's not the same every time. And and again, right. working with guys like Pete and, and Dave and Michael and George and Phil and everybody, it's everybody approves that. They're like, yeah, that's right. That's the sound. And so to Guillaume's point, yeah, sky's the limit. It's it's just about doing it right. Plus, like when we're when I did mine, I'm running through my APIs and the the chain that I have. Uh, when we did George's thing, we were running through a set of Neves that went into the SSL, and it's like that, all of that stuff. It it changes, you know. You know how picky guitar players are. It's like yeah. 
sure. it's, it's this or that. Well, you know, you put a Neve into an SSL with the right power amp and all, everything has a dramatic effect on uh, right. end result. Sure. Yeah, so it's the individual recipe from that day. And with those folks doing it, I mean, and everything down to the mic pre and the, all that stuff gets in the in the captures, right, and in, into the sound. Yeah. And it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I got it recently. I got one of those uh, uh, dynamic microphone mounts, you know, that you guys are probably familiar with. We can move the mic from, oh, so I can sit yeah. here in the studio and actually move the mic out of my cabinet in minuscule little amounts, and I can so rotate it. Right spot. Yeah, and that thing blew my mind because it's like, if you don't have an, you know, I've been doing this for years by myself in a room and sure I've worked in big studios where there's an engineer moving it and you're like, Oh, that's the spot right there. But there's something about when you've been doing it yourself forever, you got to run back out to the room, move the mic a little bit. Okay. And then you run back out and move it again. Cause you're like lit and then you run back and play now being able to sit here and move that microphone as I'm playing and just even like set up a loop in a looper is a fun way to do it. Not even play like just hit the looper and it's looping through your amp and you can just sit here and listen and fine tune in the tone. And it is phenomenal how much difference, even the on off axis, which I haven't normally, I, I haven't messed with that a lot, like going, you know, with the microphone rotating it on or off axis like that. Um, being out, but usually I'm just setting them up straight and, and over the years and then being able to do that now and fine tune things. I guess my point is it's, like a v30 and a 412 with a 57 on it it's unbelievable the amount of variation you can get by that mic position and by so you know and then like you say the room uh, factoring in and stuff so it's like endless variations right. and i guess it's the fun you're always searching for the like the magic tone you're always on that search and then like with something like your product i mean you can find it and then at least like save it as a preset but it's going to be unique like you know where, where you've got that mic position and you know it's going to be unique every time so yeah, it's super it's cool. along those lines real real quick like pro tip on the two notes um when it comes up like i, I often you will just use the um the what is the name of the the plugin is it torpedo sorry wall of sound. Wall of sound. Wall of sound. yeah thank you the, on wall of sound if you you call up um one of the cabs it often will you'll have a uh, or you will you'll get a microphone there but don't be afraid to it's not necessarily the perfect position that it defaults to so it's very easy you don't even have to be a, a engineer or an expert in tone just ever so slightly shift it to the left or right and odds are you'll hear it warm up or brighten and you'll find a spot that's it's quite nice just don't leave it there because that's what came up when you called up like a 412 and a sm57 sure. like you still got to just tweak it over like a little bit and sometimes it'll just all come into focus for you for you people always yeah. ask what's the perfect ir just give me the perfect ir and I, <laughs> there, 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 is, there isn't one by the way um phil x is on the way to canada driving his family from la right now he wanted Jesus. to join but he, he, he said something that i thought you would think uh was pretty important he said he learned to use his ears instead of his eyes and he said he got great results because he said i think that by doing this and this i would get this result every time he learned that by changing things maybe a little differently than he thought he was getting the results that he'd find and i think that's that's kind of an important way to look at it just don't assume that this with this will always equal you know utopia right out of the gate that's always a good way to approach things i mean i think in this day and age where we tend to look at music <laughs> on a screen <laughs> you know like that didn't used to happen it was like you know like right you, you just use your ears in the console you know and it wasn't like it was a lot more of that now we tend to look at things and and you know that's it's like these preconceived notions of what might be good sometimes it's best just to close your eyes and you know turn the knobs until it actually sounds good you know, yeah, but they, mo most people, especially guitarists, don't have the experience of real recording, true, studio yeah. recording, and they actually don't know what they are searching for. That's they, true. They will try to replicate what they hear in the room, but we know that uh, on a on recording a disc, an album, it's different than trying to recreate the, the sound in the room. It could be that, or it could be an entirely different creative process where you want to have a specific sound and and it's not the sound in the room it's something else so defining sounding good is 
pretty much impossible but still that's a question we have all the time and when you when you say to people well just turn the knobs actually that's how i started the, the very first torpedo were very like dry in terms of interface because i was just using my ears and i had a pretty good idea about what i wanted to get from any of the cabinets i had in my library and uh when i was telling people well just just no, don't look at the interface it doesn't matter just turn the knobs and when you're happy it's done the thing is they don't know what happy means because they don't exact they don't understand that it will the sound will have to fit in the mix either it's live or in the studio and both things are actually quite different or when they play at home and just want to have fun it, those three things are actually very very different uh, mm -hmm. that's something i learned from actually my, my customers telling me see dave dave was mentioning we have a new plate river in captorex we we added it just for the people who play at home at night and just want to enjoy playing their amps in a studio i wouldn't imagine anybody using that plate but when you just plug and have 10 minutes to enjoy playing your amp it's it's perfect right. so it's i mean there's not one perfect tone because it depends on how you want to use it and that sometimes people they expect to have an all-in-one solution something like the frozen food you put in the microwave and it's done well most of the time this sounds like shit. there's there's a reason uh, uh and we try to to not sell frozen food but you need to learn how to cook so that's the that's the the balance we we, we need to we need to try CaptorX with a move in direct in the direction not of the frozen food but at least you have someone who cook for you so that's a preset mm -hmm. and we try to to spend more time building the presets because yeah telling the people just turn the knob usually you lose them very 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 fast it's not an app and that is easy right you set everything at noon and if it doesn't sound right at noon probably it's not the right app you need to try and find something else with our stuff there are so many so many options you get you, you can get lost in and they are very very fast yeah. it's true and I mean, michael go, wrote, go, ahead. Go, go ahead no go ahead Justin, go ahead. i was gonna say michael wrote some great presets for his pack and we'll do the same for pete and and dave and phil x has some coming that he's working on so we'll make sure that we include the artist approved presets as well but again you know it's gonna be a little different for everybody mm -hmm. Yeah, the, my first preset's just called Start Here. And that that's like, if you really don't want to mess with anything, that's like the sound that I had dialed up for the um, the uh, the JEL video, like mm -hmm. Dave's cab with the greenbacks blend and stuff. And it just, it sounds, sounds great. And then, of course, I called that up with what we captured with George and was like, that's not right. Because his, the 50 watt plexi he brought, like that didn't, it wasn't dialed in for that. It was dialed in for, for my sound over here. So, you know, just, but I think if we do like for Dave's pack and stuff, just do a, a nice, like start here that helps. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just get a Yeah. Just what we like, you know, just like boom here. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Pete, how did you meet Guillaume? You guys met a while ago, right? Hmm. I mean, so my first, oh, okay. I, I'm thinking back. The vi I did a video for the original smaller torpedo unit. Oh, did you start with a cab or the live torpedo cab? I think. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and I want to say I did it for Vintage King, like many years ago. I I could be wrong about that, but that's oh, my yeah. memory. And that I think that's the first video I made for you guys when I got that unit, and. After that, I probably made contact with you because, like, hey, this thing's cool, and you know, and and then I got a hold of the live, and then I can remember making a video many years ago that I put out called, you know, something like impulse responses in guitar cabinets or something yeah. like that. That's still out there that that did really well, and I used oh, yeah. the live for that, and I used your software to make a IR in the video of because I said I said to let, there's a lot of things out there about whether or not IRs can sound as good as a cabinet or not. Let's make an IR of a sound I've got here in the studio. So I'll show the mic'd up cab sound. Okay, now we go through the IR process using your software and here's the IR and then I directly A-bead them. So I can remember that with the 
with the and i think that was around the time that we started talking then and and when that video came out and then not too long after that uh 2013 because mm -hmm. uh, that would have been 2011 or 2012 2013 i went on tour with milan farmer which is a yeah. big, big french pop artist um and uh at that point i was shifting to using heads with load boxes and sending my i actually on that tour i used probably maybe that ir that i made i think using mm -hmm. your software in the video and i used that for my tone in the pa so this was and uh, this is a great big tour that um she's like a big pop artist like we literally played uh, i think 11 nights at the arena in paris mm -hmm. um all sold out like and um so it was a, a great big tour that i took these you know the, the lives two pt 100 heads no cabinets i had no cabinets because this was a, a pop gig there's dancers and all kinds of stuff going on and the band is kind of in the back we're up on risers in the back of the stage <laughs> and uh, but it's a cool gig and some of our music is actually really cool and 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 really fun to play as from a guitar perspective so there's some neat tones and stuff so anyway i had to kind of engineer this rig and put it together for this tour and uh no cabinets that was the th or cabinets off stage and mic in boxes you know that kind of thing and i thought we got a better way to do this now hmm. you know and uh and so it was it the, the only disconcerting thing i can remember getting the sound check every day and i couldn't hear my guitar at all until the monitor guy turned on the console usually you're used to plugging in hitting the standby on you can rock through your cab even right. if the PA's not on. but in this case i had to wait till they, they pulled everything up but anyways uh it went off without a hitch you know and that i can remember the engineer uh saying to me at rehearsal well let's try marking a cab because we had a cab at the rehearsals i remember let's try making a cab and then i'll a b it because I, I had presented this idea i want to use these load boxes with these mm -hmm. irs you know and he'd never tried it he was a great engineer and i can remember <clears throat> playing maybe having my tech play i think and going in the booth at the rehearsal facility and him pulling up the different faders and listening to the irs and then the, the mics and he was like it sounds amazing <laughs> he's like There's no contest you know it's one thing if you can have a perfectly mic guitar sound through you know neve or api pre's in the studio you spent time moving the mics you've done all this stuff how often does that happen live you're usually using a 57 or something or and you're you know, nine they're draping it over the cabinet it's just it's you know and then, oh okay got good play guitar play guitar okay turn up the fader okay i got you that's about as much time as as anybody ever spends live getting tones for most gigs so with this scenario i had this ir that i'd made in my studio with a ribbon and a 57 blended and you know every night repeatable with no bleed that's another thing no bass cabinet like bleeding into you you know beside you bleeding into your guitar sound so in the pa the effect and i can remember going out listening in the pa in, in france you know listening the, and and in the arenas and stuff and just the guitar tone in the pa was just like in your face and like really present and awesome so that was when i started doing this stuff and uh, and it was with Guillaume's products you know and it was but it was back then and it was it was really great um and i've you know kind of been at it ever since really but i think and then i think you came out to the gig one of the gigs on that tour yeah 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 well the, um so with with milan the the i think the first gig happened in paris yeah. and then the next one or ones actually it was several days actually in my hometown here where yeah. we have a we have a nice arena here and uh yeah of course i i, I came to the gig and uh, Remember, yeah. the, the your guitar tech at the time lucky was already working with my products for quite some time with other uh uh pop artists in france uh, pete do you think people know that you actually played with uh probably some of the biggest pop act in, in france on tour i don't think people know that yeah i i don't think so um <laughs> that's true <laughs> Between, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, between her and and uh, Polnareff, who's like a yeah, kind of a he's not a pop artist. He's a bit more of a an eclectic sort of. How do you describe him? It's very difficult, but he's a little bit like Elton John meets Rod Stewart meets uh, the Mamas and the Papas because he actually started in the '60s. But he's like a French legend. So yeah. I got this. That's some of my favorite memories of the last ten years are getting to do gigs in France and go there. I could live there. I love that country, and uh, <laughs> I just really, really had a good time and feel fortunate but getting to play with milan i mean that was uh five and a half almost six months i spent in france that year yeah i, th I think that was the biggest touring act at the time like yeah by a lot i don't remember how many tracks 
the guys had, but the the the, the light show, the video, the robot. <laughs> yeah, the robot. Yeah, <laughs> people for her gigs. I mean, it's hard to explain to people, but I just say, imagine you know Staples Center in L.A. selling out eleven nights. Mm -hmm. Who does that? <laughs> Nobody does that. But, wow. and, and she also does these like the last tour she actually did, which I wasn't on, but uh, a few years back she did another run, or it wasn't even a run. It was ten shows, I think, and it was in Paris. And sometimes she'll do these tours where the the show is so big that you can't move it. So it, she'll yeah. set up in like in Paris, and if you want to come from the other parts of France to come see the show, you go there. And it's just this spec. A big part of her thing is the spectacle. The the yeah. You know, and and she's very kind of mysterious, and and uh, she kind of disappears when she's not on tour, not making a record, and then she'll come back four years later, and everybody's like, "Oh my god!" Like her fans, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not kidding you. Ten or uh, the week before, so we were going to do production rehearsals at at, at mm -hmm. Bercy, at the arena in Paris, and so I would walk from the hotel to the production rehearsals every day. And about seven days before the first show, people started camping out outside because it was general admission on the floor. And so people were camping for about a week before the first show, <laughs> lining up. How do you do that? At the arena here. At the arena. I've never. Oh, was it for your? Yeah, yeah. I've never yeah, seen yeah, anything yeah. here. Yeah. I've it's never crazy. seen anything like it. It's mind blowing. And 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 then when they open the doors, it's mind blowing. The first night, the doors open and people come. It's like the Beatles or something. I mean, people come streaming into the arena. And and I'm not kidding. This is very this is very French, but very uniquely French. Some of them come running in holding baguettes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember people like with their baguettes because they got to eat something with. They're in there, going to wait for the show, you know. So yeah, I remember that. I was like, most people have baguettes, and they're like running full speed. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. But um, what a tour! I think I, think I came so to I think I came to the rehearsal. You were rehearsing near Paris. And I came and you still had, it wasn't still your signature amp. It was still a prototype, I think you had at the time. It was still a CAE something. And uh, and and later on, you got the, the actual PT-100, but the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, actually. The amps that I used on that tour were my modded original yeah. CAE style, because it was 2013. So we didn't come out yeah. with the amp until the following year at NAMM. But yeah, I had two modded heads that were essentially the new version of the amp That's yes right. yeah i remember we talked about it but the that you remember the level of security during rehearsal just to get because yeah. uh, the thing with those artists and you have the same in every country so those artists don't really sell outside their homeland and uh, uh she's one she's actually the biggest gay icon we have in france uh uh, uh so there is a very specific audience at, at those shows Hmm. And uh, the, the, but it's it's really awesome. It's a great experience to go there. And, it's just uh, kind of like a Madonna kind of crowd, I would say. Yes, yeah, you know, very much like Madonna. You know, she's like the French Madonna. People say that. I mean, it's she's her own thing, but she's a little darker than Madonna in her. Yeah, music. because she's doing no press. She, like you said, she disappears in between albums or tours. She just she's out. Yeah, completely. and her name yeah. is uh, Milan. Milan Farmer. Milan yeah. Farmer. Like a farmer. Do I say that close to right? <laughs> I think yeah, I no, 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 perfect. Yeah, yeah, Falmer. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the other tour, you didn't mention it, but uh, with Paul Nareff, you were the your your the other guitarist was Tony Michael Pine, and yes. uh, so there was a uh, uh, on both those tours there were some serious players on the stage. I, I remember with Milan on the bass. I think it was John Button with you on stage. Yeah, John Button who plays in the Who now. That's mm. right. Wow. And uh, Charlie Paxson on drums. Who's Killer mm. drummer and Greg Saran, who does American Idol now. He's one of the guitar players that does does Idol. Um, who else was in the band? Well, of course, the the MD is a French legend, right? And um, but folks folks won't know here. But but uh, it, there's just some fantastic players that 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 work on both tours actually. And yeah, getting to play with Tony that was a trip. Yeah. Was, <laughs> I mean, like I remember when Polnareff was like. Uh, Michelle was like, I want you guys to do a guitar solo every night. You know, you got to come up with a, like a battle. And I'm like, you, you know, <laughs> oh, no. thanks a lot. But, so we had to do these, you know, back and forth, you know. And then and then I always remember, too, he was like, we did it a couple nights and it went well. But he was like, the end needs to be bigger. And this is Michelle's genius. He goes, the end needs to be bigger. You need to end on a song that everybody knows. I don't know, like play like when you when you at the end of the battle, you end on smoke on the water. And I was like, smoke on the water. I was kind of like, every really like it just seemed so like and then 
the first show where we did it, I can remember the great big festival was probably like 50, 60,000 people or something. So we get to <clears throat> get to the end of the back and forth, the shredding, shredding, trying to tear each other's heads off, you know? And then I look at him and then I go into, ah, 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 ah. and the crowd just goes like 60,000 people go, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, this was a really good idea. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm not the rock star, you know, polar rap artist, you know, it was like, it was brilliant. And it was so fun every night. And then we'd end the, the, uh, played like the vocal melody on the guitars. And we'd end up smoke on the water, playing it in harmony, you know? Uh, and it was so fun, but yeah, God, good memories, cool. man. I miss France. Really do. That's cool. I, mean, I think your friend uh, on the American, uh, American idols, uh, using the captor X for the show, by the way, Oh, and cool. I believe the guy on the voice is using them as well. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think probably the first time he would have seen them were on because John and I, John was also using the uh, torpedo for bass uh, yeah. IR on the Milan tour. So I remember Greg going, okay, what's this stuff, you know, and getting interested in it then. So, mm. yeah. Let me jump to a couple super chats real fast. Uh, Harlan Jackson, what do you guys think of the rev amps? I saw their cab sims are available on the Captor X. I think you have the Kemper Beat. Uh, rev amps, well, I guess cool amps, cool. yeah. Uh, so it's rev with two V's, so I guess that's the one we're thinking about. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we've we've uh, I'm very good friends with the two owners, Derek and and uh, and Dan. Um, they, they were probably one of the first wanting to have the technology into the amps. So it's not that they have uh, virtual cabinets, but they also have amps. Uh, so they originally released the D20, then the G20, which are 20 watts lunchbox amps with a torpedo technology embedded. And then this year they released the, uh, the 120 Mark III, which is the big uh, uh, four channel, and, and uh, probably the 100p as well. So they have they, they, they started with smaller launch boxes and now they have the bigger amps, uh, actually the entire line, I think now, with the torpedo technology in. Um, they, they, well, I, I like those amps. Obviously I have uh, plenty of them. I don't have one right here with me today, but I usually have the G20 here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's hard to me to say bad things about them because we work together. <laughs> no, I mean they're good good products, good products, good people. Yeah, good stuff, definitely. Yeah, I mean, they, it, was, it was very they build bright. Everything in in Canada, uh, uh, they do it seriously. It's it's great boutique stuff, and they they are very very successful with their range of pedals, the the G three, G two, mm. G. So they have two, three, uh, three pedals. Um, and uh, yeah, they 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 actually they are quite successful with their line of amps and amps and pedals, and uh, I'm happy for them. They they deserve it. They work properly, like you could expect from expensive boutique stuff. It's it's good stuff. Yeah, definitely. I think there's something important, Mark. I'm interrupting you yeah. on purpose. That that I want Pete's, Michael's, and David's opinion on, and yours as well, Mark. Mm -hmm. So everybody asks about Kemper, right? And I've I've had a Kemper now for eleven or so years, and 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 used them all over the country with various acts. There's a big difference between a tube amplifier and a Kemper, but I want you guys to to say, you know, why the IR tech and and two notes is important. What's different? You guys know this, and I I want the ad, the audience to hear from you guys because you you probably have a little different opinion on that. Well, I'll defer. I'll pass it to Dave. What do you think, Dave? Well, uh, um, the Kemper can do, you know, a, a, a good capture of your tube amp. Uh, there's other products that can do these captures now also. Um, but, you know, if you're using it live, you better do You better have a lot of, cap, you know, captures because uh, you can't you can't just turn a knob. And uh, I mean, you can theoretically turn the knob and, and, but it superimposes another EQ, <laughs> uh, on, on the tone. Um, so then it doesn't become, it's not your amp. It's not like a modeled, uh, product. Um, I mean, I think it serves a purpose, obviously, you know, it, it can be cool, but if you compare it to the real deal, it's, 
there's just a little something lacking in the feel and and yeah. you know it's just it's just it's not quite like the real deal i mean i would uh it does serve a purpose obviously when when you have limited ability to take things and you can only take one little thing you know it, it definitely serves a purpose and you know now like with michael michael did a uh I kind of, I kind of gave up, you know. It's like everyone was doing these cap uh, captures of <laughs> uh, of of our products and things, and I'm like going, "All right, let's do our own," you know. So he did uh, kind of an obscure amp that we used to make called the Naked Amp, and Michael did uh, the first uh, licensed uh, pack that uh, we're doing for uh, a Kemper. Um, so big hairy guitars or big hairy profiles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you go? Hairy, you tell them. Big hairy profiles. <laughs> big hairy profiles or big, big hairy big profiles. Hair. And you can get the official Friedman Naked Pack. We're going to do some other packs, you know, and some other amps and maybe even some obscure things that are kind of unique that, it, you know, everyone hasn't done already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because otherwise everyone's just like doing it anyway. So. <laughs> Right, you might as well get in on it. You might I might as well do it the way I want it to sound, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Look, I've got a Kemper yeah. and I've got real tube amps and I've got the Captor X. Um if I were to play live with a band, which I'm not these days, but if I were to play live with a band, I would use a tube amp. And if I needed to either have attenuation or to go to front of house, I would use a Captor X. I would not use a Kemper to, to go live. Because to me, when I turn that Kemper up really loud, there, there's a feel thing that you're just not getting that you get with a real tube amp. So the feel thing for me is important, you know. Um, so that, but if I were to record, I think the Kemper is great for recording. Um, and also, I mean, the way I use it, I just have because I don't like having a ton of pedals and stuff in my like where I want to practice. So I just have the Kemper in like my family room area just sitting there and I, I can use effects and I don't have to worry about, you know, I just have the remote sitting on the floor and it's all in one package is really kind of easy. I don't have a bunch of shit laying around my, my family room. But other than that, I mean, I, it's two bamps all the way for me and cab Sims, you know, if I was, yeah, it's, boy. it's interesting. It's like with the amp, <clears throat> it's really hard to replicate the dynamics of having a high voltage tube. Mm -hmm thing you know like 400 450 volts on the plates of you know that tube amp and rolling down your guitar volume so the other day i had this train wreck amp here oh it's like amazing a, and i put it yeah amazing. i put a video out and it, it's like that thing uh if you guys haven't seen it check it out it's like this amp that this fellow i mean it's just unbelievable but it it has so that feel that you talk talk about like any amplifier like on earth that thing is like the to that to the nth degree i mean as far as the feel and the dynamics and the roll down and the cleanup and all it's just alive right so i did um i used quad cortex but i made a couple captures of it just to see but it was more for like let's see how close these actually sound well it's pretty good um i find with the quad cortex there's one little thing that folks know about that it seems like when you do a capture it ends up a little cleaner than, mm. the, than the actual amp so that's fine you can just dial the amp up maybe a little further than you would uh, you know, for the if, if you were just playing through it, and then you do the capture, and it's good. And I was like, wow, uh, that sounds really good. But what about the magic of the thing in the room when it's here? So I made a direct head capture of it, and then I, you know, you do that. You can do that with a captor or with the, uh, or you you'll take the line out, then run that into the unit, and there's no cabinet or mics involved. You're just capturing the amp, and then you need to pair it with either an IR or maybe run it into a power amp and a cabinet, and play it like you would, you know, traditional amp. So I tried that. And it was cool, but then I went back to the amp, and it was like, okay, the tone is pretty similar, actually, but the magic. <laughs> yeah, there's this. The, the, the magic is missing. Yeah, all the it it fed back a little. If you watch the video, you know, you'll hear the feedback and the harmonic stuff that the amp does and everything. It kind of does that, but like, it's not the same. But the sound is really good. It's like, well, that's a totally usable sound, actually. I'm talking through a matrix power amp, so quad cortex matrix power amp into the same cabinet, and then directly A-being with this, you know, fifty thousand dollar guitar amplifier, <laughs> and um, like hardest thing you could probably be trying to do, right? And it did pretty good, but it's like, 
when I plug back into the amp, the feel, that instant, like there's this thing that that train wreck does where it's like you hit it and it's like it sags for a second. Then there's this quick recovery because it's a solid state rectified amp. And whatever he's done, I don't know what it is. Dave probably could explain it better. But the the way that amp just compresses and and then blooms and does all this stuff, and it, there's still no substitute for that. You know, I I think that thing's really great, and it does a really great job. And I'm I'm a fan of the device. I'm a fan of the Kemper too. I think that like Dave said, they serve a purpose. If you got to fly to go do a gig, um, and you don't have a choice, and you can't sure. take an amp, and you can't, yeah, you know, they help us get work done. You mm -hmm. know. I've yeah. flown with the Kemper to go do a gig in Canada. I've done different, you know, different things with it and stuff. And it, it there's, there's there, 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 there are these great tools. But that back and forth just the other day was my, <clears throat> you know, that's the thing. So having said that, when we're talking about two notes and, you know, other things that do IRs, I've got an amp, the PT-15 that's got IRs built in, right, and a load mm -hmm. box. That amplifier, I call it modeling the back end. We've modeled the, you know, that's what that's what two notes is doing, I think. And it's 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 you you've got the tube amp all the way down the chain to the end of the speaker jack. And now you're modeling the back end, which is the speaker cabinet and the impulse response. And that's it. You know, and that opens up this world of possibilities for recording, you know, for people in apartments, you know, to get guitar tones that they could never get otherwise. It opens up world of possibilities for consistency live. Um, you know, getting these great, great sounds consistent night after night, like I said, with no bleed. Um, and it's not the same thing as modeling an entire tube amplifier, you know, it's a much, it's, it's, I guess it's probably a much easier thing to do, you know, is to, yes. you know, with IR convolution, IR technology, whatever it's, you know, a good load box. And it, it's, it's a much simpler thing than trying to capture the entire dynamic character of a whole amplifier and signal, signal chain and trying to replicate that using you know computer chip or whatever yeah, yeah. Um, but there is there is something that's nearly impossible to replicate with the, any modeling solution which is the interaction between the guitar and the first stage of the amp mm -hmm. because yeah. you have a generic one in the or like in any di on an audio interface or uh, on a camper it's the same so you have that what i don't know something between 500k or a mega ohm uh, impedance like generic impedance while amps will be different in that regard uh, and this is purely hardware this cannot really be captured it's really depending on your g guitar pickup cable and and the input uh, uh, stage of the, of the amp this is this interaction as as soon as you plug into any digital solution is lost while and it's actually the same with the the impedance of the load box versus one of whatever cabinets. There is still a little bit of difference here. Um, so the, the that thing is, I think DigiDesign back in the day tried to replicate that by having uh, an impedance that <coughs> changed depending on the model you would do, but the rest of the modeling is crap, so it didn't save it, in my <laughs> opinion. Uh, Camper and, and others are way better, or Fractal, or or I didn't try the quad cortex yet, but they are so much better than the old digi design technology. But still, th there was that idea to have a, a, a different input impedance depending on the, the amp model you would try to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it but it's hard to do, and it cannot be 100% correct. There is also the fact that when you plug into a tube amp, the first stage is usually high, high voltage. And this will have an influence on the tone while on any modeling, you will be on five volts, maybe at best, yeah. maybe a little bit more. And uh, again, this is a hardware difference, which is not really possible to replicate with modeling. So there are still some untouched territories where I don't think modeling will ever be very good at it. it it's still a, an amazing solution. And I, I mean, when you think about the product that the kids can have today for a couple hundred dollars, like the, the Spark by uh, Positive Grid. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those entry-level products sound amazing compared to the crap I started on in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mini. Fire sure. BE Mini. And well, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I always say with the modeling, it's, it's sort of um, with the, it's a race to the bottom meaning so you know you originally had like fractal and and you know uh, line six and everything else 
But now you have it's a race to the bottom price wise. Mm-hmm. So now you have you know uh, uh, you know like the more and the 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 head rush uh, the ho tone thing or mm-hmm. the uh, you know and and when you hear them now and like the functionality of them they're they're great and now that's like three hundred dollars mm-hmm. or or less you know and and I'm like. Hmm. <laughs> it's a race to the bottom. That's that. That's the problem. So that now there starts not to be a, like a huge profit margin in it for companies, uh, and mm-hmm. in, in some of these things. Uh, obviously, the quad cortex is is expensive unit and 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 quite good. Um, but you know you can still get r- pretty damn good results with some of these other things now. Yeah. Yeah, but you still have the the cost of the parts, like what you have in a quad yeah. cortex or in a fractal. Yeah. All the DSPs, the proper converters, yeah. mm-hmm. proper power supply, and all of that has a role in the in, sure. in the sound. Yeah. So, the the cheap stuff can can yes, it works. <laughs> speaking speaking of that, how are you doing with chips? Oh, you wanna you wanna see me cry on TV? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I know I know about this. So like, hey yeah. man, if like if like uh, Toyota is having a shutdown, and like I heard about all these car companies, Honda closing a main plant Ford. like for a while because they can't get chips, right? So yeah. So guess what? I'm buying the same micro controllers than Ford or <laughs> other guys who. Yeah. So well, first of all, the, the so we have audio converters in all our products. Well, yep. guess what? AKM. Yep. <laughs> was our exclusive Fast. supplier and the factory burned down in november so yep. this was my christmas gift for oh, last God. year yes it's a um, nice christmas gift right oh i loved it i mean it's <laughs> not as great as having my own building on fire so you win yeah, this one it's just <laughs> true i might win with that but yeah <laughs> but still so we had to redesign first for serious logic parts and guess yeah. what Right after we finished validating new new PCBs for CaptorX and everything, Search Logic told us, "Well, you know what? We will ship your stuff in 2023." I was like, "Oh, oh okay." Oh, so we then had a third revision of every product yeah. to include uh, Burr Brown stuff, which is great. It's more expensive, but it's very good stuff. So I was yeah. happy. So yeah, okay, let's spend more money on on. That's fine. We can we can absorb that. Sure. So let's do the other one. So it went great until ST Micro told us they wouldn't deliver the micro controller we needed, which are the same as what you find in most cars and oh, yeah. <laughs> planes. And I was like, oh, so that's a fourth revision of our product. So we have now, I don't even, I mean, we spent seven months or eight months redesigning stuff that was selling just to be able to keep them on the shelf. Yeah. It's just yeah no, no you know, and yeah it, it, wow. yeah i know it's horrible uh pretty much uh now like anything that we were gonna do in digital market is on hold until yeah. we can until all this kind of subsides a bit you know because not only that is 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 then the then the manufacturers and or the distributors are then like it's like you can have it but it's now uh five times the price oh okay five times, five times. i would buy that because i'll tell you what <laughs> on the on the on the akm uh, uh converter that we use which yeah. car probably on one of the products it costs probably 0.72 dollars something like that yeah, or one dollar yeah. I got one. I mean, I got two thousand offered at eighty bucks each. I had a guy reach out on to me on LinkedIn and offer me a hundred dollars a chip. Oh, that's and, crazy, man! Uh, it's just yeah, stupid. yeah. No, so it, it's it's like unfortunately, your whole product line is based on digital. Yeah, yes, digital I'm aware stuff. of that. So yes. it's like now, now it's for me. It's like yeah, it's time to do that vintage line. Yeah. Well, okay. So <laughs> we could talk I, about I'm tubes. running out of things. I'm running out of other things, though. There's other things that in in the supply chain now that is horrible, like electro electrolytic capacitors. It's it's like we are literally almost crippled because we there aren't any. We can't get them, hmm. and it's like I don't know. 
luckily we had placed an order in in we had placed an order for something that hopefully will come that will that that will make us whole on that but uh, i mean we're i i there's none <laughs> yeah. it's like oh we'll have them in um april of 2022 oh god what <laughs> well, yeah and then who, who even knows i i've heard of people like going to buy things and you'll see it on their website you know uh a certain quantity oh great and then like literally like if you wait an hour like you'll come back and somebody's Go bottle on. 30 oh, yeah. gms come yeah. and bought them all or unfortunately we we we, we make a months. large quantity of amplifiers yeah like it's it's a huge quantity so we literally drain all these distributors we we're the ones that go in and do that right but i mean even it's you like guys, oh there's a thousand here them. buy all thousand it, it, done it, gone but you guys are using a certain you're an amp manufacturer big amp manufacturer that's one thing but if you got gm coming along and they're like they panic buy just like people were buying toilet paper yeah. at the beginning of the uh, uh you know and i think that's what's happening is it's just they're getting you're getting wiped out by these massive companies that are like they use the same chip yeah. or the same whatever yeah. and they buy them all right so it's so crazy. gm and ford right now are having impending layoffs i have a friend of mine that's in the skilled electronics section of ford and he's about ready to get a two or three month uh stay at home and mm. hopefully they take care of their employees but they've got cars that they can't complete so um yeah i had a friend do the same thing he worked he works for ford and hmm. uh he was off for months and months he's back now uh, so that must have subsided for him mm. but unfortunately they're they are union employees so um thankfully almost impossible yeah. to get f fired <laughs> it's interesting i mean this this goes into the i was reading a story about the housing market and you know housing is crazy i mean the price crazy. is real estate it's nuts but part of the problem is like new housing in say los angeles county um there's rules that in, in order to complete a, a new place and then sell it it uh, part of it being complete is like it having appliances, you know, so having a stove and having a fridge and having a microwave, but you can't get those things right now because of the chip shortages and stuff. And so it's like, there's no fridge. So they're like, yeah, 2023, we can get you your fridge that you ordered for, you know, so these places are sitting and they can't sell them. And this is driving part of the, you know, the housing crisis is that there's just, a, you can't complete enough new housing with the, with the, with the current rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. I'd like to address a question that that's on the chat because that's a that's a misconception about how the electronic supply chain works. Uh, someone was mentioning the fact that well, if if there were more cheap factory in the U.S., there, there wouldn't be so much shortage of parts. Well, I'm sorry to say that's just not how it works. The shortage comes from the fact that there is an insane demand since the the, the start of the whole COVID party which is when you try to equip billion, nearly billions of people with computer at home needing webcam, uh, uh, you have a whole technology change with cars, with uh, uh, um, GPU, thank you, Bitcoin and all the mining, uh, with uh, 5G, with uh, IoT. So all those technology changes happen at the same time. There is a huge demand of, on parts just because we equip a billion people with laptops. So the, 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 you, you can have a thousand factories in the US. If they, can't get, if they can't get wafers, there is a shortage on silicon. There is a shortage on any, any component you need to build capacitors, to build chips, to build. So, so it's not about the location. It's about the insane level of the demand at this time that uh, you can't. I mean, AKM factory burned down. They will need probably 18 months to build a new one. You have the, the rooms they need to, to, to create those cheap. You don't build them overnight. You need several months just to empty them from air. The, right, the chips take uh, almost a year to make, right? Or six months to make. It's not the chip. It's just, just building the rooms. It's, right, not, right. It's, not, it's not a kitchen, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't build a rocket overnight. Those things take time, especially when everybody at the same time want the same robot to do part yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Everybody, I mean, I mean, we had a short a shortage of toilet paper. You see what happens when when the demand exceeds so much what what you can supply that suddenly yeah. there's nothing on the shelf. That's what's happening to us. Except we are very small. I mean, I, I 
David, I include you in this. We are very small companies compared yeah, sure. to car manufacturers. To 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 we are we are dwarfs compared to those guys who build millions yeah, compared of, to Apple of products. Yeah, yeah but but I, I remember how, how many how many Apple how many Apple computers, just computers. Let's say just laptops. How many Apple laptops do you think are made in a year? Hundreds of millions. Uh, at least it's like crazy when you like think that. about it. I, I don't even know what that number is. I it's interesting. Or how many phones? The, your phone has these chips. You know that. You know, uh, uh, everyone has one of these. You know, uh, and, I know that uh, when Apple moved to a new like uh, memory technology or to a new screen technology. They just buy everything that's available on the market. Yeah. You have nothing for several months. Yeah. And then you can, you may have some. So, so actually, the, the the size of that business is not that huge. You have a very limited supply for some memories or displays, or so it it doesn't take a lot to destabilize that that entire market. And we had several phenomena happening at the same time. So yes, yeah, so, so that's why we are all back older because we, we have demand, so people want to buy stuff. But you had the same time, same stuff with wood on guitars, or even even like I waited a year for a hip shot bridge, one of the guitars I had made, just because I think I don't know if it's Fender or who said hip shot. Yeah, I'm buying everything you can make this year because I need yeah. it. So. Yeah. And we are not a priority for any of those big chip manufacturers. No. Yeah. <laughs> so every morning small, we go to the small potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. But, which is also a good thing because we can, okay, sometimes I get a thousand of this, two thousand of that. So every morning that's our gymnastics. We go to, to Farnell, DG oh, King. God. We try to every day. And Fucking we start horrible. Uh, <laughs> it's, well, it's a different job, right? We yeah. we trying to find parts is actually a big part of what we do instead of building new stuff. We're, we're, we're right. doing the same things. I mean, I all the time I'm getting, you know, okay, we can't get this. What can we use? Hmm. Okay, now I and now I need to go out and look, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> Hey, I don't think it will. I, I I don't think it will get fixed before twenty twenty three. I think next year we still no, be. No, a, we're 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 in a world of hell right now. Hmm. Uh, uh, just so sorry. you're aware, we we have done a very good job on our global supply chain to make sure we can have product for customers. So we're good. trying to make sure we can take care of people. So great, yeah. that's good. I'm throw that in there that we we're we're trying to be as nimble as possible on that side. Awesome. Uh, this is for me. <laughs> <laughs> this question is for me. Yes. What's what's up with those Sweetwater non Floyd no ho guitars? Well, they're non Floyd no ho guitars. <laughs> what, what do they have a go to on them? Uh, yeah, go to five ten bridge. Uh, that's it. That's the only difference. Okay. Uh, yeah, they're cool. I love to go to a bridge, and you can always uh, can always get the uh, Wilkinson locking saddles for it if you'd like. If you want to make it more of a locking setup, yep. Pete has those. Which Already I comes with the uh, I do locking tuners. So I'm looking at this guitar now on the Sweetwater website. There's some interesting colors you can get, like a like a candy yellow and a with, with our oh the candy yellow is amazing. I don't know if I call it yellow though. I've yeah, always sort of, copper. I've always sort of uh um kind of uh like questioned the yellow mo uh, name. Uh, it was more like a candy orange almost like a coppery candy orange. Mm. Um cool color though. Tom H. Dave Friedman. I just ordered a run 50. I dream about owning a Handwired BE, but I'm poor. So what did I miss? Can can you compare the run gain against the BE? Thanks for doing the that. BE. It, it, it's a BE channel in the run fifty. It's literally a BE channel and a kind of Fender esque uh, clean channel. So you're really sort of getting it. Uh, the the runt is a, maybe slightly brighter and slightly more percussive. Um, 
just with the choices of caps and stuff in that series amps. So you basically have it. Uh, stay curious. I'm using a Marshall 1922 speaker. This a bad one? I've never heard of that. I don't even know what that is. I think Me that's either. one of their. <laughs> I think that's the designation for a 212, 1922. Oh. Like, I think that's the standard 212 with 75s that they sold for so long that they probably still sell. I think. Hmm. That's correct. But I think it's so. If that's the one, it comes with some uh, G12T. I think. Yeah. Which That's is, of, no, I don't like it very much, but it works. It was great in a mix. I mean, but oh yeah, I just looked at it. I'm looking at it now. It's uh, yeah, G12 T75, eight ohms. Yep. That's a standard 212. That the yeah, you know, kind of like the inexpensive. They sound okay. It it it, it, it might not. You know the the G12 T75 is a a little. Brittle, kind of to me, metallic sounding, but um, it can work. Depends on the amp you're putting into it, and how much EQing capability the amp has. You know what I mean? Like you can you can kind of make that work. Some people like them. I mean, that's the that's the cab that you were saying that that actually Eddie Van Halen like on Soldado sometimes, right? Well, the the, the, the yeah the thing. original, but those were kind of old. The original uh, seventy five watt Celestians. He had bought a cab from uh, when he was doing the um, the 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 fuck album, right? So he was doing that record with Andy Johns, and he bought he well first he rented a cabinet from Andy Brower Studio Rentals, a slant cabinet JCM eight hundred with those speakers in it, seventy five watt Celestians of the time. Now I don't know if they differ now, and that with a Soldano for him sounded. Great. He he actually bought that cabinet with those speakers at seventy five watt. So somebody mentioned uh, that that's actually Ingve speaker of choice. That's true in the chat. Well, originally Ingve speaker of choice was the the sixty five watts. Right back way when. Yeah, right yeah. So like I because I have an old uh, checkerboard cabinet here, which uh, will probably wind up getting modeled uh it, with the new pack <laughs> that has original 65 watt uh celestians from the 70s mm. so this there was a transition there in the 70s that went from the black backs to the, the 65s and uh there it's a great sounding speaker man it's really good so yeah Awesome. Yeah, one, the Phil X two twelve that we did has the sixty fives in it. Um, Dave, question for you: Side, yeah. side, when you blend speakers, have you ever blended G twelve seventy fives with like Heritage twenty watt Greenbacks before or anything like that? I know you have messed around with a lot of those. Not generally. Now. I generally stay away from the seventy fives entirely. Um, but um, anything can work. You know, that's the thing. I mean, like anything can work. Uh, who's to say? There's so many variables with this. So, like, you have a 75 watt speaker, right? So then, well, what kind of mic pre are you using? Where's the mic placement? What mics are you using on the cabinet? There's so what mic, you know, how many variables do you want? So, if this speaker is a little too bright, okay, we're going to move this mic a little off access, a little darker tone. You're going to blend in a different mic. Okay, you're compensating or re EQing essentially. And then, and then, you know, you have to take into consideration that old school engineers like Don Landy, for instance, like Pete and I have gone down this path of Van Halen before. An old school engineer generally, you know, a lot of times the it would go into a Neve or something they were using or api and they would just eq the mic till they got the sound they wanted mm -hmm. and it wasn't yeah. like a flat response it wasn't like just bring it up completely flat and adjust the mics Th that's more a little more modern old school was like mic it up and and tweak the eq till it sounded right mm -hmm. so yeah. i don't know like, what does the uh, speaker sound like if you take a 75 watt speaker 
and mic it a certain way and then start playing with the eq and it changed it completely how how does that sound in comparison to not you know like you could you could you eq it to sound basically the same as say a greenback speaker it won't right, break right. up the same but there's a guy in the chat that says uh he's got a late 80s 1960 with 75s i don't hate them typically only use it on a dsl like i can't remember how many times you know the early 2000s i'd be touring and doing like one-offs radio show with somebody or whatever where you fly out and do a you know and see backline i would backline a yeah, dsl yeah. 50 because i had a dsl 50 then and that was the it was like okay i know how to make this amp sound pretty good and so i'd backline that and i'd always specify a cab either uh 1960 bx with greenbacks or 1960 yeah, right. bb with and how greenbacks. many times did you actually get that never it was like <laughs> one here's in, the 75 watts here you go that's buddy. right that's right and I, oh god here we go 1960a regular old you know with 75 right back. You know, and you know yeah and you know what they were like always okay i was like no oh, not so bad as a matter of fact you know like when i was playing with polar ref the, mm -hmm. the exact same thing happened because I, I sent my amps, but I didn't send cabs. And I was using the Torpedo Lives anyway on that tour going to the front of the house. But I had a, a they were hosting the IRs, but I had a cab on stage just so I could get a little feedback, a little interaction. Mm -hmm. And a, the cab the backline company sent was a 1960B with 75. I was like, oh, yeah. of course. And I had the same experience where I plugged in and I was like, you know what? That sounds okay. It sounds pretty good. It's not like awful, you know, it's decent. And uh, and, and it wasn't like any, it was just my on stage sound. But mm -hmm. yeah. It was a, they're, they're okay you know they're not they, got, they do have this like cardboardy thing you know what i mean like, yeah. like, <laughs> like certain sound to them it's kind of greenbacky but like with this cardboardy thing i don't know how <laughs> well, i think you, you find it everywhere because it's the cheapest four by 12 marshall has to offer yeah yeah right exactly backline companies bought like a million of yeah them. Oh, yeah <laughs> I, I do want to say something phil x's uh 1960 that he's had for about 20 years it's a 900 series. It sounds exceptional. It's got 75s. And I largely think just because it's been so used and so yeah. beat, it's kind of beaten out the harshness of it. Mm. That's, That's true. You know, my 65 watt cabinet isn't harsh in any way on the top end. It just sounds kind of cool. Hmm. Large dust cap, just like the 75. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty damn cool, actually. Yeah. Hey, we got a question from Harmonicaster. I can't post it on the, the video because I missed it in the chat. But uh, it says, concerning what people say about gear and tone, how much is empirical and how much is voodoo? Oh, man. <laughs> that's a tough one to answer, man. Yeah. Um, okay. I need, that, I need that's a tough one to answer. You need more specifics to that, I think. You know, uh, there's a lot that's kind of like bullshit. But then there's there's valid points to some of it but you know here's the thing everyone hears different true so um some people can hear certain changes and some people can't hear those changes at all hmm. well, pete and i have uh experienced that recently and um like literally, depending on how someone's hearing is or deteriorated their hearing is, they might not hear any difference in something. Meanwhile, for you, it's like so obvious what's going on. Like, oh my God, like that top end is changing completely. You know, like, oh my God, it's way rolled off. They're not hearing anything. Yeah. Just personal so, taste, too. I mean, it's like I knew a guy that was a great player in Edmonton where I grew up, and he liked direct distortion he liked no speakers he liked the sound of distorted and he told me he goes i love the sound of distorted horns like distorted tweeters you know i was like really and i mean it was the most ah, you know like just like but he's like yeah that's my jam and i mean he was a good player. <laughs> that's my jam <laughs> yeah he was into it and, uh, he managed wow. nails it back to it's, yeah, it's it, and, and in those contexts, it actually is kind of cool. I did something recently and was learning this part, and I realized it was very DI and fuzz, you know, where it was like a, a dark sound mixed with in the other speaker, a very bright DI fuzz. But I mean, that's reeling in the years too, right? It's like, right, you know, right? The uh, right, isn't that completely just yeah. DI fuzzed out? Um, I also led Zeppelin off uh, the communication breakdown. What is it? Isn't wait, one of those. Yeah, tracks is completely direct. 
has a D, I, my, you might be communication breakdown. I can't remember, but somebody told me that once. So I'm like, no, and I go yeah, it's just like it's it's just like a mic pre into another compressor into another compressor, and they're just saturating each other. Hmm. That's helter skelter too. Yeah. Well, and re and revolution. Uh, re revolution. Yeah. Or oh, sorry, revolution. That's what I meant. Yeah. 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 Revolution. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, revolution. They've made pedals based on that, right? I think JHS has a pedal. Um, of course. You know, the, the first <laughs> record that was on sort of was a Marty Robbins record, and the preamp. Oh. There was a Marty Robbins song, and I can't remember the song where they they distorted the preamp, and that was kind of the first thing. So believe it or not, the whole thing was originally a country. I'll have to find the song. Wow. That's, That's kind of how the buzz title developed from. Long story, but I can't remember all the details. Yeah, it's funny because we're listening the other night to, like, the, I was watching that new McCartney documentary with Rick Rubin and the Kings. Yeah, King. it's awesome. Yeah, it's really great. And it, when he oh, went, talking about like what he liked in the 60s, like what bands came out that blew you away. And he's like, the Kinks was cool. Like, you know, he's like, you really got me when that came out. That was cool. And I was explaining to some of those and like, you know, that, yeah, that's supposedly a torn speaker. Like they, they that yeah, was the way they not, they didn't turn the amp up all the way. They went, how do we get the nasty sound? Well, let's razor blade the speaker. <laughs> and that's that, you know, so there's all these different, the, the really neat thing about that time in recording to me is it's like, you know, the, the, the reason the, the term recording engineer exists, these guys were actually like, they wore lab coats, you know, like, especially in yeah, the UK. Totally. There were rules. And, there was rules like you put the U67 on the amplifier only this close and it's never louder than this and you have to do all this stuff. This is how you did everything. And no, <laughs> you know, musicians weren't allowed to like, do any of that stuff or be even like, you know, so it was really George. We can, we can, I think, credit, uh, oh, maybe Marty Robbins, you know, in the States, they were probably a little more wild in the beginning, you know, and willing to do. But I think in England, it was like really George Martin saying, let's just let these guys do what they want to do with the Beatles because they're, they're making a lot of money for the company. So right. they want to distort the shit out of the mic. So, just, so I, I <laughs> the, the song was in 1961. It was called Don't Worry. Um, and it starts about a minute and 25 seconds into the solo. But Grady Martin was the engineer or was the guitar player on that. So don't uh, worry, Marty Robbins, 1961, Fuzz was an accident. <laughs> I gotta listen to that track. What's the song called? Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, Grady Martin was the guitar player on it. Okay. No, oh, that's interesting. I, I haven't heard. Um, that. I want to make sure because we got to wrap up. Um, so I want to make sure we get to some questions here real fast. John DeShane sent a super chat. So he wants to know, Dave, about the cab that you're going to include. Is that going to have a Friedman BE cab, like two V30s and two 25 Yes, of course. Okay. It has to be a Friedman product, so it has to have the Friedman cab along with some other cabs. Uh, that will be super cool. Okay. Um, I'm just going to move right along. We got Ty Berard. You guys are talking about all Celestian speakers. What about new speakers like Hisu Damon or Eminence and <sighs> Jensen? Okay, I'm going to kind of I'm going to kind of go out on a on a controversial limb here, and I I don't really think other than maybe some old Jensen speakers that were originally in a Fender style amplifier, I don't uh, really believe in anything else other than celestian we we did use the square back eminence uk's and uh george lynch's orange and they do sound yep. really good but those are obviously very old and you can't i don't care them. for them yeah <laughs> <laughs> it'll be controversial but i don't care for them you know who i tried that i liked i tried the wgs speakers yeah Joe, wgs has made some good but they're celestian clones you know Right of stuff. Right. So uh, I mean, they they've made some good speakers. Uh, I don't know. I I just kind of. Your selection, man. For me, it's, it's for, for me, it's like an an old an old vintage style greenback, a V thirty, or maybe maybe the vintage sixty five, or a Vox Blue. And other than that, I don't really like anything. Hmm. We, we, I, call me crazy, but I I to be honest, I don't really even like Jensen's. Uh, I, I would actually rather hear a Fender with a Celestian. Hmm. Uh, I mean, like some of the greatest Fenders ever. Like I remember working on, um, I think it was Glenn Fry's Fender Deluxe, not Deluxe Reverb, a uh, Deluxe with no reverb. 
112, and it had Vox Blues in it. Oh, man, that amp sounded great. Hmm. I know a lot of people find that, that you can replace in an old Fender. They'll stick a, you know, a, a gold or something, an Alico gold or something. It's like, whoa, it sounds great now. Or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, mean, I, I always know. find the eminence stuff to be a little dark and a little weird and how it breaks up. At least maybe my ears are just tuned to liking Celestian, and I just don't care for the other but I, you know, I, I over the years, I mean, I worked for a, a studio instrument rental company early on when I was 18 years old, and the only fucking stuff that got rented, <laughs> rented and used, pretty much, unless you're bought, you know, renting the vintage Fender amp, which had a Jensen maybe, uh, or Celestians, right. just, just yeah. all day long, you know, vintage 30s, uh, Greenbacks. Various things, you know, all day long. I went through a serious scumbag phase. I mean, where I was like M seventy five. Well, a scumbag is a great rep representation of a of, of vintage Celestian, though. Sure. Again, yeah. it's still getting the Celestian. Yeah, you know? I, I really enjoyed them um, for for quite a while, and I and then I was te tearing my hair out, kind of just like going. I mean, just long story short, I ended up back at Celestian, going, you know what? The good old um, the regular line greenback kind of sounds really what i like and they're easy to get and it's just simple and so yeah. i kind of did but i did like the m75s i mean the m70 you know he started doing all this stuff the now, with like the piper voice coils and stuff and he'd be like yeah. don't use this don't use this speaker in an it's 25 watts and i mean no more or it will catch on fire yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it a paper voice coil and all that you know and but that speaker i would try and go oh, shit, i crazy. will make an honorable mention though that the, the the i think as a a cool alternative a ev12l hmm. yeah. was a cool yeah. speaker and it, it it did some cool stuff it did great stuff with fenders and there were a lot of guys that even used them with their marshals back in the day and they put them in in four by twelves my god it's the heaviest thing known to mankind hmm. didn't jake use them uh well yeah everyone used them warren used them everyone used them Zach yeah. used them. Zach Wild. Right. Everyone, you oh, know, yeah. it's like yeah. there is a thing to that sound, also. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe that's a cab that has to be in a pack. Hmm. Yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, it's a great speaker. Hmm. I mean, it's a that's killer a good idea. <laughs> in a in a uh, Fender or something too. It's a no brainer. In like a tw I mean, imagine how heavy, but in a twin or something. That yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I mean, in four twelve, it's even. F oh God. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'd be so heavy. <laughs> oh we, my god, it's so heavy. It's not even funny. We had somebody uh, in the chat say that one of the the George Lynch cabinets, the one of the VH cabinets, didn't sound good, and he's using, I know, the VH two, which is who? the L, the darker one. So I had to make sure he knows that that's pretty brash, and that was supposed to be blended. So uh, I don't know that one's, but that one still sounds good. I think. I good, mean, yeah. I don't know. Um, yes, it's supposed to be blended for sure. That, the that, that, that's, that's the JBL, yeah, and and yeah, that's supposed to be blended in with the goddamn greenback. You know, it's not supposed 50, to be fifty fifty or so. Right? Yeah, um, or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh, Javier Montoya, thank you for the super chat. I didn't see a question, so if I missed it, I'm sorry. Um, no, I, there's something here. Was there? Yeah, it's right here. Uh. Oh, here it is. Is there something new cooking for the Dirty Shirley Mini and Pink Taco? They're not discontinued. Yes, there is something new cooking. Just a couple added little features on them. There, the current model is discontinued, but there will be some new ones coming. Uh, uh, but th but there's still some orders being filled uh, with the old model, so there's still they they still will. I think there's like a hundred or 150 of them or something that are still going out. Okay. We've got two more questions and then we're going to wrap things up. Okay. Um, Hyperbole kid. Thanks for the super chat. After using a Kemper and Axe effects for years, I can't stop using real two bams because of the feel and tone rule. Uh, do you see a macro trend where two bams are making a big comeback? I, I, I think so because of the, the use of products like the captor X and, you know, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm seeing that too. I'm seeing sort of uh, even even a more simple amp coming back, like more vintage. 
mm-hmm. style. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because everyone can now at home can can crank up a old Plexi on ten. You know, with the Captor X or whatever product you have that does that. Mm-hmm. And um, sure, I mean, when mm-hmm. I was testing the Captor X, I literally had my my uh small box 50 on the plexi channel on 10 Hmm. and listening to it and you know so that's essentially kind of like a vintage plexi which cab did you like dave just curious i like george's uh the the vintage one or the the mark the marshall one and the vh cab those were my favorites I mean, yeah. Phil, Phil's, Phil's 75 watt cab was cool. Um, but I tended to, I, right off the bat, like, I just, like, when I first plugged in, I didn't hook up the iOS app, so I had no idea what the presets were. And I just went through the six presets. And uh, I was like, number four. And which was the the Celestian of the VH1, I believe. Yeah. And right. uh, um, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that one. I just like that one right off the bat. And and then I hooked up the iOS app. I go, oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Funny. Use your ears, right? I had just I had just rewired that cabinet for him before you guys guys went and did that. You're like, it sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know uh, if I even listened to it to be honest, but yeah. It's a small world. Yeah. <laughs> the last last question here or comment is for Andrew Paul from, um, and we're giving this nice super chat, and he's talking about your amp, Pete. Uh, love your PT15 amp, man. Just wanted to thank you guys so much for the show. So educational and just great to hear from you guys with passion for their craft. Pete, your show is great too. I agree. Pete's show is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And yeah, the amp, I mean, thank it's you a good for <laughs> it's a good tie up because you were mentioning uh, do we see the trend of tube amps coming back? And really, with that amp, we tried to make something that put it all together, you know, like the new stuff, yeah. with the good old tube amp. And that was the goal, you know, to yeah. make it really easy and fun and an amp that you could use through headphones that walk out on stage, plop it on a cab, plug it in direct, play through your right. cab. Be great, you know, like just and so simple. You want to get more gain, you reach out, you turn the gain knob. And so I see, I see a, uh, uh, there's a lot of folks that will go modeling because it's great. I mean, there's all kinds of great stuff about modeling and stuff, but then they get tired. Well, I'll never forget one comment that I saw somebody make on the gear page where it was a guy that had gone to one of the, you know, cool modelers that was, you know, expensive kind of high end one that was really fancy and all that. And his uh, wife made a comment to him one day. He'd had it for a couple months and his wife said, you know, you used to play more and now you just kind of tweak <laughs> you just kind of tinker. She used to play songs more, and now you're just kind of turning knobs. That's great. And he got was struck by that, you know. And he's like, "What? Well, yeah, I'm like always just some kind of just playing with my tone as opposed to like just playing guitar." And that's the thing where we gotta. Um, and I think if, if modeling is to really, like Dave knows, um, I I see so much stuff come through, and the more stuff I come through, and the more older I get, the more I see like you know. <laughs> Life more is, disgusted you are well, with well, well no life is not infinite you know and like the amount of time we spend on learning curves in our life is like you know it's a real th- thing you know we want to like i want to play and make music and have fun but learning new shit all the time is is um it's, it's this is quality problems because i get to try a lot of stuff but it's also as you can imagine if all you were doing doing was where do i get to the menu to get to this feature that i'm supposed to check out and the, and if you do a lot of that after a, a long time oh, it, it, you know what here's the thing um to elaborate on that so i i did a pedal board for someone and they had a um, and this is no um dig at them but um they had the source audio tremolo very simple little pedal. Very simple. But we needed to enable external tap tempo. Okay. So in order to do this, I had to download the software with my on my computer. I needed to um, find a cable that's the little mini USB to the regular USB, which I asked Pete for. And then 
uh, once we figured out how to get that all working and talking to each other, and then we had to enable it. Okay, that's great. But then you had to realize that it required a special circuit in the tap tempo box that you had to actually build into a tap tempo box. It wasn't just a simple momentary switch, click, click. You had to build this special circuit into the box. And by then I was ready to kill someone. <laughs> um, it, it, because it what nothing went smoothly in this whole process. And uh, I'm like, just put a tap tempo jack on it that you can plug a, a pedal into and tap tempo it. That's it. Just do that, please. Yeah, you know, you don't, do don't do that. It's, it's and, so uh, uh, and meanwhile, we were doing the tap tempo also for a Boss DD500. And the guy that was working with me, Jamie, uh, he just he just like kind of looked in the menu, kind of paged down a few pages, and he goes, oh, oh, tap temp. Oh, yeah, okay, click, 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 click. And in five minutes, it was working. Yeah. Don't make it overly hard for people. Mm. People don't want it. The more the, the older we get, the less we want to deal with this, too. So, I mean, just don't make it overly hard. It just it, it shouldn't be pages and pages upon stuff to figure out how to do a tap tempo. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous, you know. Yeah. So, you know, make make the user interface as easy as possible because guitar players are very short. We just want to play. Know. We just want to play. Uh, want to play. Is this, this is like, you know. Make it easy. It's, make it's it easy. Always a make it easy. It's always make a it simple. Off. Yeah, because people ask for a million options all the time. Well, do they do ask for a million options, but there's so many people out there that the minute they're giving those options, they're like glossed over. And they're done with the product because it's it's just too much, man. It's just yeah. too much. I just don't yeah. want. I I just want to plug it in and turn it, like like the capture X that was sent to me. I could plug it in well, and then turn the the six position knob and I go. Okay, there's six sounds. Great. Right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, I wonder like, who did that. Because yeah, I did exactly it, you did. I did it on purpose. But, you just plug in and go on. You know. Yeah, plug in and go, and, and you know this is like I just don't want to. I don't want to mess. Yeah. I don't want to mess with it. Yeah, it's almost a good thing to tell people that like, like in a manual, like the Captor X or something. You know where it's like, hey, you know what? Like this thing has a million options, all kind of great stuff you can do, but you're going to get six great sounds right here. And if you don't want to play, boom, decide just what play. the six great sounds are. Right. Yeah. But if we give you the, the six food groups here, whatever, greenback, four, 12, V 34, 12, six, open back, five four, or six, I, you know? six. I know we're running right. short on time, but this is a pro important story and a very true one about Phil X. I sent Phil a box and he took it to Bon Jovi rehearsals because he couldn't get a hold of uh, backline cabinets. Easy. The very first preset, which was heavy, dry, as soon as you turn it on there, the front of house and monitor mix guy just go, what is that? And he's like, it's this. And they said, don't touch it. And of course, he started touching it. And they right. said, put it back. But that was the credentializer is that he yeah, got a exactly. set out of the box. No one wants to mess with this shit. <laughs> right. Well, there's the, but, yeah. but there's a whole audience that does want to mess with it. But those are the people that are actually not playing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's good to note that, I mean, the first time I took actually PT-15 to a studio, they had a cab set up, mic'd in the other room. And I said, just take the direct, you know, and just give it a yeah. listen to see what you think. Because I'm interested, too. This is the first yeah. session I've done with it. I took it and I gave it to the guy. He pulled up the fader and he went, well, that sounds great. Let's move on. <laughs> and <then> we <laughs> with that. You know, I didn't change anything. I didn't change anything. Yeah. That, that to me is like, that's real world. Like, well, let's go, let's go, let's go. Right. Let's get the arts and music mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's cool. Totally. That's awesome. <laughs> well, look, I want to thank uh, Guillaume, Justin from Two Notes, uh thank you so much guys for coming on the show uh make sure everybody in the show check out two notes you can go to sweetwater in the link that we provide uh and buy uh, buy a captor x buy a captor x buy a, what's that buy several several, several. <laughs> yeah we exactly. need one for each amp um right, i want right. to thank uh pete and michael nielsen uh coming on you guys are awesome thanks mark Maybe um, some uh, Audio Technica. Um, yes. Headphones. 
whatever we said. <laughs> I don't remember the name. ATH fifty ATH M fifty X. There we go. Yeah. Good headphones. Those sound great. If you want to sit at home, not disturbing your wife or child, um, in at two in the morning, cranking a plexi into the thing, go for it. Yeah, it sounds really good. Yeah. Um, next show will be Dave and myself. We'll schedule that um, at some point. Yeah, check out our talking Facebook. about something. Yeah, we haven't worked it out yet, but we will. So <laughs> probably been about two weeks. We'll have a, a show, Dave and myself. So, um, guys, hang on, everybody, while we say goodbye. Have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was great. Thank you, Mark, for having us. Oh, thank you.